Welcome everyone, it's just a joy to see the gallery uh, pretty much jam full tonight, so uh, that's a happy, uh, happy change of events uh, over the last couple of years we've had, so it's just great to see. So without further ado, first item of business, Madam Clerk. Is roll call your worship, I've taken the roll and all members of council are present with the exception of Councillor Cameron. Very good, thank you. Next item please. Motion to adopt this evening's agenda, your worship. Moved by Councillor Cullen, seconded by Councillor Lupke. Any changes or additions? Not seeing any. Call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Next item, please. Confirmation of the minutes of the special meeting held June 6, 2022. Moved by Councillor Shiboye, seconded by Councillor Frangi. Any errors or omissions? And seeing none, we'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Next item, please. Confirmation of the minutes of the meeting held, the regular meeting held June 6th. Moved by Councillor Parker, seconded by Councillor Lupke. Again, any uh, changes, errors, or omissions? Seeing none, calling the question. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Next item, please. Under the order of presentations, Your Worship, we have Julia Greer, Sky Schott, and Kobe Lim from the Youth Activities Program to give us an update for 2022. Right on. Come on ahead. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sky Schott. Um, I am the program assistant at the Junior Program of Youth Activity Center. This is my first year working for the program. My name is Julia Greer. I have previously worked as a youth activity leader for two years, and this is my first year as the program assistant of the West Division of the Youth Activity Center program in Brandon. Good evening, uh, I'm Kobe Lim. I was a former youth activity center kid for four years, youth activity center leader for two years, and now I'm the program assistant at the East Division of the Youth Activity Center. Today, uh, we are taking another step forward with the City of Brandon and officially announcing our candidacy as co-mayors. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. I'm, I, I'm running by myself. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so the Youth Activity Center, or YAC for short, is a completely free summer program for youth to attend during the summer months. We are absolutely beaming with excitement to have this program back since our uh, last summer in 2019. Yak has three centers across Brandon. Yak Junior is for ages seven to nine and it is at the Valley View Community Center. Then we have Yak West for kids between the ages of nine to 15 and it's at the West End Community Center. And finally, Yak East with ages nine to 15 located at the East End Community Center. Every day at Yak has a different theme that provides a vast array of experiences for our youth. We have days that promote physical activity through play, days that spark the imagination through crafts and other hands-on activities, and days that highlight the cultural diversity amongst our kids and within the community. With Yak being so easily accessible, we leaders have witnessed children from all walks of life make friends and memories that will remain with them for their lives. YAC strives to inspire kids to have fun and carry kindness wherever they go. Of course, we would not be able to do what we do without the support we received from Council and the partnership with the Central Council of Community Centers. As Kobe mentioned, YAC is offered in partnership with the Central Council of Community Centers, who offer support through the receipt of provincial and federal grants. Additional donations from local businesses and organizations allow us to provide new activities and equipment for our center. We would like to thank you, the council members, for your continued support throughout the summer. This program not only allows ourselves and the 16 other members that you see behind us uh, gain a meaningful employment throughout the summer. It also provides community members with a free 
quality programming and activities. In 2019, YAC had 785 youth registered with a total attendance of 8,174 throughout the summer. These numbers are a direct reflection of the positive impressions and connections that kids make at our centers. It is the experiences and relationships that the children build with us and other youth that bring them back time and time again. We hope to make a positive impact in our community again this summer, and we once again thank you for your support. We have a short three minute video from YAC in 2019 to highlight our program, and then we can answer any questions following the short clip. Thank you. I come to YAC every day because I enjoy YAC. I'm bored out of my mind being at home doing nothing. Otherwise, if I was at home, I'd just be sitting there, I don't know, watching TV, playing Fortnite. I come to YAC because it's really fun and every day is something new and it's always fun to try. I come to YAC because it's really fun and most of the leader, if you're having a bad day, most of the leaders, you know, they're to cheer you up and stuff, so yeah. To have fun. I don't know. This is not a game to, to have jokes, okay? It's my turn, not yours. To try to make friends. Because it's fun and I get to see all my friends and it makes me happy. I thought it would be fun to make new friends and to be a friend for other people. I, I'd say about seven, seven or eight, I think, yeah. About since I was seven, so, no, seven or eight, so about three years. Like, um, 20 years. I think three years. Three. Three years. Three years. How do you? Mm, two years. It's been awesome. <laughs> what iPad all day long at our house? The games. What would you do at home? Uh, play iPad. Sleeping? Fortnite. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Being lazy. Yup. <laughs> My favorite day was when we went to the movies because I watched one of my favorite movies. It definitely would have been Carnival Day, but I wasn't here because I was at a basketball camp. But I'm looking forward to it next year. Or Cooking Day, because man, I love talking to Bang. That's tomorrow, so I, I can't wait for that. Yeah. Um, probably the dance, because I got to dance with my friends. Um, movie day, because like we have so much fun in pool days, because I like swimming. Halloween, Halloween day. Mm. Carnival day. Youth gift back. I, I like the Kondo Day. The first year I came to Yak, everyone was like welcoming me nice and stuff. Being able at the start of the year to see new friends and see them how like they've grown. Like a long time ago, I'd watch America's Got Talent and there would be this funny uh, guy who didn't talk, he was like a mime. And he'd do a lot of funny things, his name was Tape Face, and now he has a show in Vegas, so it's pretty cool. And back in the Yak South, we were doing the talent show, and then I actually won first place during that, and did some of his moves, so it was actually pretty fun, so yeah. Um, me getting my Yak Leader t-shirt, it made me very happy. Being nominated a junior leader, and getting a blue Yak shirt. Uh, if some people watch me, like if they're not like in Yak, they need to join because this is like a thing of a lifetime. I think if any like other kids don't come to Yak that they should now because it's really fun. If you like 
if there's nothing for you to do at home, nice place to have fun in the summer at. There's a lot of people. It gets kind of crazy, but it's always fun every day. Everybody here is nice. Like, not just the leaders, like all the kids, man, make some friends. You know, there's a lot There's a lot of people here. You can have fun, you know? Um, yeah, Wes just got a basketball hoop, so I'm pumped about that. But you know, you can play soccer, make friends, talk, you know? So, man, come to Yak. If you live in Brandon, it's a free program. Um, in the beginning, like, even if you're a quiet kid, like I used to be when I was starting Yak three years ago, you learn to open up to people and become friends with them. Uh, it is a wonderful experience, and I would recommend coming. Even if it's your first year, don't be shy. You'll make lots of friends. I can be your friend. Yeah, I want to say that it's really great and it's for free for like kids that like let's say don't have as much money. They could like their families could come to Yak and like so like even if like they don't have a car or something, they could like try to walk to Yak and have a reason to have like a good time. Yeah. comfortable and, and opening them up and playing games and stuff, so it was awesome. Um, and I just wanted to ask if somebody knows how many have registered thus far this year, because they were at the community center again Thursday looking to, re or Friday looking to register actually when I was there, so. For you, your worship, to Councillor Parker, um, we've brought in about 300 registrations so far, um, but people can just register on the first day, so we expect many, many more. Awesome. Um, and so the, the last comment, um, sort of related but not really, um, the rec department, there's a few keyboard warriors who've given them grief over the last while, but we don't have good recreation in Brandon and yada, yada, yada. And, and I, I would say the, there's some examples that are uh, quite different. This, this is a shining example, but also Brett and Coralie, um, I think, spearheaded the uh, it's a program for kids to try t-ball and soccer together combined. It's a great program. It's sold out. Um, so there is, the, our rec department is doing some good stuff. And Yak is sort of the crown jewel, I would say. But uh, kudos to you guys for all you're doing and have a great summer at it. Thank you. And Councillor Barry, did you? Yep. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, please. Thank you, Worship. Uh, three to presenters, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I certainly love the enthusiasm and the energy. and. Maybe you can leave some of that energy in the room tonight because looks at our agenda tonight, we're going to need it. You might want to share some of it with us. We're going to be here for a while. My question mostly pertains to, I know this program is very, very popular. And as it was mentioned many times in that, it's free. So the kids love to come to something like that. Obviously, you probably can't accommodate everybody that wants to come. So how do you actually uh, do the registration to allow the kids, like is it the same kids that get to come all the time or do you have kids that have the option to maybe come another day because maybe they didn't get in this day or I'm just looking at how the you know how the parity or the split the fairness so that everybody can have a chance to attend uh, when the camps are full. Your worship to the counselor. Um, so our program, we do have a 75 limit at each center um, and each day is different throughout the summer. So we have given um, the option to parents and kids to come whenever they want. Um, or we will ex be expecting lines from 
who knows, 12.30 on, and we will count down the lines to the first 75. So it's kind of a first come first serve program. Um, we do hope that um, we do get a bunch of different kids that can enjoy it. Um, there really is something different each day. Um, so we've, we've told children that if it's, you know, if you love sports, come on our sports day. If you don't like arts and crafts, don't come on our arts and crafts day. Or if you want to come and try it, we encourage that. But yeah, we're expecting full centers of 75 each day and we're looking really forward to it. Quick wall viewer, and thanks for that answer. That's kind of what I was looking for. But it's a great message to get out to the people that don't be discouraged if you won't get in this day, come back another day, because there will be a chance for you to get in. That's great. Thank you for all you guys do, it's great. And Councillor Fawcett. Yes, thank you, through Your Worship. Good presentation. I, uh, I overheard uh, Colby singing on the weekend too, which he did a good <laughs> job of, and uh, I appreciated that. Um, now, where do people find all this? Just to be sure, like, so if they, to know what day is what, can they go online? Is there the website? Is it, what, what, what's the route to, to know what to do? Thank you for your question. Um, so uh, all the information can be found online, uh, www.brandon.ca slash yak dash overview. Um, there you can find all of the calendars and registration forms for all three of our centers. Excellent. Yeah, Excellent. so the calendars just outline the themes of every single day. Um, and then th from there, they can choose whether, what days they're interested in and stuff like that. And do we, do we share that information I other places uh, around town? Like, where, like I'm, one of the things I'm thinking is that uh, West Bend Immigrant Services, uh, if they have those kind of schedules as a place that they can go to. Through you, your worship, Councillor Fawcett. Um, yes, we actually attended around 10 um, schools this year um, through the Brand School Division. So we attended grades um, grades two to grade eight. Um, we handed about 2,500 brochures throughout the Brand School Division. Awesome, okay. And I'm gonna piggyback on what they said right off the bat. Uh, I, I used to talk to them at school, lots of uh, these people when, when they were in school, that the people that get involved in community stuff like this, there is a chance, if we're lucky, that you guys will look at running for politics at some point. <laughs> and it's important because good people need to do that. And you don't, you don't realize it right now, but the people you're sitting with somewhere along the line, people like yourselves do end up running. I know Kobe's mom and dad would not want him doing it right now, but at some point we do need people to do that. And so by being involved in the community and seeing the benefits, you're exactly the kind of people that somewhere down the line we do want to see running for politics. So good community people there's always space for you so thank you for what you're doing thank you i didn't see other hands up but i'll take any other questions if there are some i think not so thank you very much uh like some other counselors have indicated i've, I've been to lots of yak activities have had me come out uh, over the years and it is certainly one of our our uh crown jewels as, as was uh, indicated you guys do an awesome job the people that are watching at home are only getting uh, a portion of the enthusiasm there's about uh, 16 uh, leaders uh, in the room in the in the blue shirts and we've heard from uh, three of them but obviously this level of energy is going to come out at all of the uh, yak programs uh, throughout the year and of course our own uh, regular recreation staff are also in the in the uh, chamber tonight that really kind of put this together uh, throughout the year so we're really grateful for all of you uh, it makes a big impact on our community and and we thank you a lot and it certainly did cross my mind as Councillor Barry indicated we have a significantly long agenda tonight and it was great that you folks are starting us off and help to kind of fill up our gas tanks here to get through it uh, that level of energy uh, is uh, contagious and uh, should get us through the night Thank you very much and have a great year. I look forward to seeing you uh, throughout the summer at uh, some of the various activities and events. Yeah. Great, thank you. Very good, a motion to receive would be in order, please. Councilor Berry, go ahead. Uh, that the presentation by Julia Greer, uh, Sky Shot, and Colby Lim with respect to update on the youth activities program be received. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Parker. Any discussion? Call for the question then. All those in favor? Oppose? That is carried. Thank you very much and thank you to all of you for coming out and uh, helping us out tonight. And next item, Madam Clerk, please. Um, I would just note to Mr. Lim, and any other YACP, if you want to come see me about getting registered as a candidate, 
You can call my office anytime. We can accommodate you. Um, sorry, your worship. Under presentations, we have a presentation from Greg Brown, the airport manager, with respect to the airport land use plan. Very good. This is a hard act to follow. I feel bad for you, Greg. But uh... oh, I, I did notice that. I was like, yeah, that's fantastic. So the airport land use plan will not be quite as exciting. Sorry. So thank you, Your Worship, members of council, for allowing me to present here tonight. We're in the middle somewhere. All right, there we go. Um, in the interest of uh, the amount I see on the agenda here, I'll only cover some of the high points here, but I wanted to make sure that you had the full presentation so that you could review uh, at your leisure and uh, review our land use plan. Uh, just a quick couple of things about the actual airport, just some of the history. So the airport was built in 1941, although it has had a number of upgrades since then. Uh, some of our infrastructure is 1941 related. Uh, we have about 300 hectares of land. Uh, the runways that we have is so 0826 is the main primary runway. Uh, it is about uh, 2,000 meters long. Uh, both ends of it have approach systems in place, which are a plus. Uh, accommodates up to uh, a Boeing 737-300 is uh, what we can handle at the airport. Runway 1432 is our secondary runway. Its length is quite a bit smaller at 900 meters. It's daytime use only and it's for light aircraft. It, uh, the secondary runway is actually uh, milled asphalt. It's gra considered a gravel runway. Uh, in 2020, we, or sorry, 2021, uh, with council, we hired a consultant to come in and look at our land use plan and some of our fee schedules that we had in place. Uh, we did not hire a consultant to do our full master plan. We had uh, a master plan that was uh, established in 1986. Uh, a lot of that is being updated. We've updated many parts of it already. So we focused in on the specific things that we needed help with, which was looking at our land use, how we could better use it for aviation and non-aviation use, as well as looking at some of our fees and uh, in our schedules and how, the, how our programs work. Uh, some pluses here, again, I'll just, I'll just cover a couple things here. One of the benefits at the Brandon Airport is that we are surrounded by rural properties. Uh, another one is that we have runways of sufficient length to handle a 737, which is quite a bit larger than the current aircraft that is servicing Brandon. We have uh, the Q400 is about a 78 passenger aircraft. 737 would handle 130 plus, 130 to 145 uh, passengers. Uh, we're the only airport within 200 kilometers. Uh, that has scheduled commercial service. We do have service provided by a national carrier. That is another good thing for the airport. We do have some weaknesses. Uh, our failing water system, uh, like I said, our infrastructure is from 1941, so our water and wastewater system is a 1941 infrastructure. Uh, it, uh, it is going to hamper our ability to grow the airport in the future. Our terminal apron, uh, the current apron at the airport is quite small. In fact, uh, it can only have the Q400 on the apron. We can only handle one aircraft on the apron when, uh, when we have some <coughs> service. Uh, we, are, we have no scheduled air service traveling east or to southern locations. And we also have uh, some infra infrastructure uh, uh, growth issues with uh, the gen on the general aviation side for aprons, tie downs, and taxiways. We do have a lot of land though. So there is potential for land development at the airport. Uh, and it's good land for industrial land to be used, commercial industrial. It also is land that could be used for uh, both aviation commercial and non-aviation commercial. So there is a lot of potential there for that development. But uh, one of the big ones off this, off our threats, is we are having recently uh, with South, Southport Airport is uh, been changed from a military base to a private airport. They are, they are of course gonna compete with us for that commercial infrastructure that is out there. <coughs> uh, 
talked a lot about this. Not that I keep covering. Uh, when we sat down and looked at some of our rates and charges, so when we looked at our land lease terms, so we have a we own the land at the majority of the land air side, and with that we have tenants. Uh, we looked at the lease terms and compared it to other aviation sectors. That is different than how we do business as a lot of the non-aviation side. Uh, one of the things was that most airports lease land for a 20 to 30 year life cycle uh, so that uh, when, when uh, tenants are building infrastructure on that property, they have assurances of what that infrastructure is, that they're going to still have it in 20 to 30 years with their property built on it. Uh, the short lease terms were a significant deterrent to uh, business development at the airport is one of the largest complaints that we do hear from our tenants. Uh, lease rates, uh, there was some volatility in the lease rate program uh, because we followed a uh, rate per, uh, uh, sorry, uh, land value rather than that of square meter. So as the land in a five-year term, at the end of that five-year term, if the land has gone up significantly in value, as we have seen in Manitoba it has, the tenants then experience a significant increase in their lease rates uh, corresponding with that. So a lot of airports, what they do is they lease land in a per square meter so that it's easier for them to project over a 20-year life cycle what their rates are going to be year after year after year. Uh, landing fees were considered to be comparable to other uh, similar sized airports. Our taxation uh, was a factor in uh, the commercial development at the airport, uh, especially when we looked at non-aviation commercial development at the airport. If you consider that all the land around the airport is the arm of Elton, uh, and the taxes the commercial properties pay in there are, are considerably different than the taxation in the Brandon Municipal Airport or in the city of Brandon. Uh, some of the struggles that we face with uh, developing flights to the east is one is the distance. Uh, the other is that we have uh, leakage to Winnipeg International uh, for flights, so just more flights available to them to go east. Same thing with going south. We have uh, leakage to uh, North Dakota for some of those flights to southern destinations. Uh, one of the recommendations they had was to promote air service uh, development at the airport, direct marketing to airlines, which is something that we are actually regularly doing, trying to attract other airlines uh, and other type of scheduled routes that we can have implemented at the airport. I'll cover off uh, the next stages, the steps here uh, on a couple slides in more detail. Um, the basics that we are looking at is a mixture of use at the airport. Uh, the yellow being the aviation side of the airport. Uh, that'll be all for aviation commercial or personal aviation. And then we have some other stuff set aside for educational, which is the museum, and even the fire training grounds. We have uh, availability for them to expand in there. And then a large area for uh, general commercial or mixed use, however it, it uh, appeals. When, uh, when we do get into our master plan, which we will have later this year, so I'm not looking for council to adopt the land use plan at this time, we will have, uh, when we bring forward the master plan, we'll have the master plan adopted. This was just for your review, just so you can see what types of things that we're looking at. And then when we get to the master plan, you'll understand why we came up with some of the things that we did. Um, and again, even the uh, infrastructure in here, the way it's laid out, we're not looking to build all this at one time. We're looking to, as demand grows, so does the infrastructure needs of the airport, and then we would phase it in in that manner. So the basic recommendations that came out of the land use plan were the airport to prepare an airport master plan, which we are working on updating. The airport land use plan uh, to address as an amendment to the City Brandon Development Plan, we've actually talked to planning. That is not necessary at this time. We'll look at later in the master plan. Uh, the airport uh, revised the terms of land leases. We're already working with the property department to do that so that we can be more attractive to uh, aviation development, commercial aviation development. Uh, again, refrain from selling lots. We had lots that we'd sold off uh, in the early 2000s when we lost scheduled service. Land is not, that land has sat vacant for 20 years and now is not within our control to develop. 
Uh, land lease rates be identified in terms of annual cost per square meter. Again, we are working to have that done as well. And then again, over time, increase those land lease rates. So we're looking to have an annual increases so we continue to grow those rates in, in a slow measured response uh, that both works with our tenants and works with also increasing our budget, our, our, our uh, revenue sources. And then also proactive marketing of uh, airports or the, of the airport to the aviation industry. And we're working on that too, especially with the air carriers. The Brandon Airport does offer some incentives for them to come to Brandon. Um, and so we are working on trying to capitalize on those incentives. And that's for you. So I guess now we'll take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Brown. Just before we open for questions, we didn't give the YAC people an opportunity to escape. And as oh. <laughs> remarkably interesting as we are, this is going to be a long meeting. We don't want to get you kind of pinned in here uh, for the night. So if you're uh, wanting to uh, carry on, you're welcome to do that now without having to interrupt the meeting. So. Thank you. <laughs> you don't all have to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Things down By the way, I did ask if I could run for council or put my name in for mayor, and I was told as a municipal employee I was not allowed. That's right. Yeah. Well, Decisions that's, had to be made. That's uh, not entirely true. You could take a leave of absence, Mr. Brown. <laughs> Four Decisions years. had to be made. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we'll uh, get back to that. So thanks again, uh, Mr. Brown. So we're going to open up the floor for questions, and I've got Councillor Shaboye first off. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, to the presenter. Uh, on your recommendations on number seven, you talk about marketing. Do you work with our economic development department? I notice you use the term we all the time. Who is we? Oh, sorry. When you do we is that? in the city of Brandon. Okay. So yes, we work with the economic development department. We work with the planning department. We work with the engineering department. We work with all city departments to try and move the program forward. And it's, yes, it's very much a we as in the city of Brandon. Okay, yeah, that's because I, when you're talking about selling, your, selling yourself to the outside world, I just, I was hoping that the economic development office was included in the process. Absolutely. Thanks. Okay, and Councillor Fawcett. Yeah, thank you through your worship and uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Brown, good presentation. Um, our lots that we do have up there, they are all serviced. I know it's old, but are they all serviced? Through your worship, uh, Councillor Fawcett. Um, yes and no. All right. So ground side lots are serviced, air side lots are not serviced. They have power to them uh, and we have very few air side uh, lots left. Uh, so the part of our development will be to expand the air side lots. Um, the water, wastewater infrastructure is a challenge to expanding that. So we will get more information on that uh, kind of going forward. And, and, and of course, uh, the understanding would be that uh, the ser more serviced they are, the more appealing they are. That is correct. Go. You know, we got that all over the city. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Not seeing any others. That's covered it. Thank you very much, Mr. Brown. Oh, we're not doing that with everybody? Sure. <laughs> Until Parlo gets up here. Now. Very good. A uh, motion to receive would be in order, please. Councilor Jarley. Thank you, Your Worship. I move that the presentation by Greg Brown, uh, airport manager, future candidate for mayor, <laughs> with respect to an update on the airport land use plan be received. Seconded by Councillor Shaboye. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Next item, please. Also under presentations, we have Mr. Patrick Pulak, the general manager of operations, to give an update on the sub pump and backwater valve program. Welcome, Mr. Pulak. Good evening, Your Worship. Now, the previous two delegations expressed an interest in running for council. No pressure. I have none. Okay. <laughs> no applause here. No. That's not mine. Well, she said that up just a little point of interest. Uh, the service line to the airport, both water and wastewater, were installed in 1942. 
and as such, because the that at that point in time it was a a uh, federal responsibility, the uh, easement was registered under the name of the king at that time. Mm -hmm. It still is, and hence the problem we're having yeah. <laughs> now. Fifty-eight, yeah. seventy, eighty years old. Be another king soon. Hey, um, I'm here to just briefly give you an update on our sump pump and backwater valve program. Um, so uh, th I'm going to talk about the 2022 program and then just put it in comparison to what we've historically done over the last 11 years. Uh, the requirements for the sump pump program in 2022 are practically identical as to what we had last year. Um, we are offering funding up to 75% of the total material with total materials and installation cost uh, for, for the installation of the sump pump and backwater valve. So that's up to a maximum refundable amount of $2,500 for sump pump and pit and, and the associated pit, up to a maximum refundable amount of $1,500 for a backwater valve. Now, this work has to be completed by a licensed plumber he will, uh, that licensed plumber will provide an estimate as to that work. Um, then after that estimate is, is provided, uh, a flood protection permit must be applied for either in person or through the online portal, and I will provide that information at the end of this presentation as to how you can make those applications. During the installation, progress, uh, uh, installation process, this entire process is run through our building safety uh, section. There are two inspections then conducted by an inspector from the city of Brandon during that, and that's coordinated with the plumber who's doing the work. And then on that second and final inspection, once the work is completed, the homeowner must submit proof of payment after which uh, a check will be issued for their eligible amount uh, within 30 days. Um, so we have been doing the 2022 program since April 4th. Uh, initial for the budget, uh, the initial budget for the program was $100,000 financed through the utility and that was approved by council during budget deliberations. To date, 43 applications have been approved and uh, total rebates that have or will be issued is totaling 92,843. So we're just about at the end of that $100,000. Fortunately, a further $150,000 was awarded to the City of Brandon for this program through the Mitigation and Preparedness Program, of which Council will be uh, establishing a reserve for that money to be deposited into. So I just want to talk briefly what has been the historical update in the program. So you look at 2011 through almost 2015, this was when we used to be in partnership with the province. We used to do a 50-50 cost share on that rebate. Um, usually that amount was $50,000 city, $50,000 the province. The uptake at that time was I'd say mediocre at best. Uh, 2016, and, and I'd, I'd say a lot of that had to do with how we got the information out. Uh, 2016 through 2020, we didn't have a program. The province was an interest in cost sharing that program. 2021 is when council stepped up and approved an initial budget of $200,000, which we, through two further council meetings, we increased to $400,000. And uh, through that, I mean, we were able to establish um, 190 applications through the program in that year and of which we spent out of the $400,000, uh, we, we uh, rebated $387,000 back to the residents. Where we are currently is, like I said, we're at 43 applications and $92,000 back uh, through the rebate. rebate. Um, so I talked about the funds spent. This is just correlates exactly to the number of units that we've approved. So. Uh, again, last year we did $400,000. This year it's a total of $250,000. Uh, I wish we could extend it, but um, you know, the demand on the reserve with the water treatment upgrade 
Uh, we have to put some more thought on how, how council will have to give some more thought on how we want to carry this program going forward in future years. So I talked about how to apply. You can do it in person. You can do it through the City of Brown Development Services Division, which is at 638 Princess. Uh, you go through the 7th Street entrance and you just talk to a person there and they'll help you establish an application. Alternatively, you can do an online application through permits.brandon.ca. Uh, if you want further information on the program, exactly what it entails, what your responsibilities are, you can go through the Brandon website or again, you can go in person to uh, Development Services and somebody will, will discuss the program with you. That said, uh, I will take any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Pulak. Uh, it's been a great program and uh, it's good to be updated on that, but we'll open the floor for questions. So Barry. Thank you, Worship. Just a comment first and a quick question, but um, thank you very much, Patrick, for the presentation. I know that this program that the city implemented uh, a few years back, but up, upped it last year with the amount that we were given out and that uh, has been taken advantage of by many, many people in, in my ward because of the uh, flooding issues we've had in, in certain parts of, of the Linden Lanes Ward and that. And uh, nothing but rape is about it. They just think this is one of the best things the city's ever done to offer help like that. I know it's getting challenging as we go forward uh, to keep up that type of money we have to keep taking from the reserve to do it. I hope future councils can continue to offer at least something to residents of Brandon because it is a very, very popular program. Um, my question is, so, so far this year, because we do have it going for this year, is, is how many applications or how much money out of the 100000 have we used up already? So it is that amount of 92800 oh, which okay. represents the 43 uh, successful applications Great. approved. But doing the math, so you'll have another 150000 and extrapolating that, you're probably going to get to do about another 65 or 70 yet available on top of the... 45, so it will put us well over 100 uh, uh, if the uh, applications keep at the pace they're coming. Would that be correct? I would agree. Okay. And it's all dependent on the weather, too, if we're having much like we've had this wet spring. certainly uh, makes people uh, recognize the need to have this residence. And Councillor Lupe was next. Uh, thank you, Worship. You kind of danced around my question a little bit, but I'll make it a little right. bit more plain. Was uh, through you to our presenter was uh, just under 8,000 remaining and the 100,000 allocated in our budget, but that 150,000 is available immediately for residents to continue the program this year? I understand that it is. Um, it has to be deposited into a reserve and before we can actually start utilizing the funds. That's part of the conditions of the grant. So council is given second and third reading to that tonight. Once that established, yes, we can use the money. Okay, thank you. Hey, Councilor Shaboy. Uh, thank you, Worship, through to the presenter. Could you give me a, a rough estimate of how much it would cost to install a sump pump and a pit, just roughly, from your applications received? Uh, uh, through your Worship to uh, Councillor uh, Shaboye, uh, unfortunately, I'm possibly the worst person you could ask about that. Uh, I, I've never seen the applications myself. I would suggest you're looking in a, for just a backwater valve, you're probably looking at close to $2,000, uh, of which we give 75% rebate on. Uh, the sump pump and pit, I couldn't be even begin to guess. It, it, it's more money, hence why we, we offer a greater rebate of $2,500 for that. So you're probably looking at three to three and a half thousand dollars, maybe more. Thanks. Any other questions? Councillor Cullen. Uh, thank you, Worship, through you to Mr. Pulak. Uh, moving forward with new development and uh, renovations and whatever, uh, we is it true we've pretty much solved that problem now because now if you were doing anything major or you were doing a new uh, new build, you would be required to put in a backwater valve right off the, off the hop? That and also you're no longer allowed to, during the summer months, to discharge your sump or your or weeping towel goes into a sump. It's no longer allowed to discharge in the storm sewer. 
during the winter months, we will allow it, so there is a valve that you can control, but we've built it into our policies, or the building inspectors will ensure that uh, there's a valve, so summertime it's one way, wintertime it's another. Good, thank you. And I think that was all the hands I had, but anything else? And has it covered? Important uh, program, so thank you very much, Mr. Kulak. A motion to receive would be in order, please. Mr. Lupke, go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. I move that the presentation by Patrick Gulak, General Manager of Operations, with respect to the city's sump pump and backwater valve program be received. Seconded by Councillor Barry. Any discussion? Call for the question then. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Thank you. Next item, please. Under the order of committee reports, Your Worship, we have the personnel committee. Uh, we have community feedback. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I skipped right over that. Okay. Community comments, feedback, Your Worship. Okay. I saw Ms. Much. Poole come in, and I thought, we got to get to her. But. Yeah. <laughs> no, so this is a portion on Council's agenda that it uh, holds open for anybody in the audience who would like to come forward and provide any feedback on any item on tonight's agenda. And we allow a total of 15 minutes for uh, this uh, section. And anybody that has comments uh, are welcome to come forward. Good evening, uh, sir. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Councillor uh, Garnet Boyd, I'm a resident of, uh, of um, Vic, uh, University Ward, and unfortunately our councillor isn't able to be here tonight. I understand he's in uh, York Factory, so great place to be with all the all the bugs and black flies this time of year. So, I mean, what I wanted to speak to to you tonight was uh, you're making a presentation or making a decision tonight on on fire pits. I've got some concerns and regulations that were discussed at the last last meeting. Uh, looking at the ones going forward, there's a great presentation was made by uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Parlow looking at, at their report going forward and the main recommendations going through there. I agree with those recommendations that they had. The only one I would like to see you consider is using the Regina uh, area going through of allowing fire pits from, from 12 p.m. to 1 a.m. instead of 12 to 12. Now, if you are considering any other regulations, I have a concern with the buffer zones. Looking at that one, it's 95 meters when you look at the fogging regulations, and that's as a crow flies. And my, I know from concerns that there are people that live in, in different levels of the city. As a crow flies, it affects the person down below, but meanwhile, there are more than 95 meters if you went down the grade. So I have concerns of using 95 meters looking at that area. Also looking at the one, that 95 meters, looking at it for fire pits, I believe is too large of an area. And to get a fire, fire pit, I believe if you went through on the one and looked at having your neighbors surrounding you sign on that approval of getting a, getting a permit, that that should be a recommendation enough going forward without putting in, the, putting in a buffer zone. I also have a concern with what you were looking at for, for wind speeds. I understand you were looking at 25, 25 miles an hour with a ma maximum wind speed of gusts of 30 kilometers an hour. Take this evening. It was 22 miles an hour was a regular speed. 32 mile an hour was the, was the wind gust according to the weather network. And it was a beautiful evening out there. There was hardly any wind in our backyard. Most city lots in Brandon are covered and have uh, good tree coverage in the area. So it cuts down a lot on what's, what's there for wind. So I think looking at that one is, is too stringent going forward. I think it should be minimum of 25 miles an hour going forward that one. and with the wind gusts, looking at 30 miles an hour, I should say, and wind gusts of 35 minimum. You're also looking at imposing a regular annual fee, and one was just thrown out there of $50. I believe doing that, you're gonna get more people just put in fire pits and they're not even gonna go for a permit. You're just trying to get people to avoid it. So looking at the one going through, I consider one-time fee on registration of $10, which is help cover administration costs. And instead of uh, painting everyone with that same brush going forward on the one, you may want to consider different guidelines going through. There's an education going through in the first call, and I understand there's only 85 calls that were made to Brandon, Brandon Fire and Emergency Services going forward on, on the one. There might have been more complaints to counselors, but that's all that the uh, fire department was receiving. 
They were going in doing education costs and there was very few follow-ups. But if you are looking at the one going through, look at the repeat offenders. Don't, don't paint everybody with the same brush and go with a $50 fee. You could put a penalty on the person if you're called back to that area. That's up to you what you would like to decide. I agree that no one living in town needs to have a fire pit burning all day, all night. But remember, for many citizens here, a relaxing time with family and friends around a fire pit may be their staycation. Not everyone can afford a cabin or a camper to get away and enjoy that open fire and campgrounds that gives them quiet time to spend with family and friends. So I, and if you are able to get to a campground, there's no limit on fires, only a quiet time. So thank you for your presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Boyd. I hear that uh, laid out uh, quite well. We'll open the floor to any questions uh, that people might want clarification on. Not sure there are any. Thank, thank you, you very much. Probably still have a few minutes left in our uh, comment period, so I'll uh, leave the door open if there's anybody else in the audience wants to comment on any item on the uh, agenda tonight. We're happy to have them. Okay, I think we have that exhausted. So thank you very much. Next item, please, Madam Clerk. Into committee reports, Your Worship, and we have a report from the Personnel Committee. Very good. And I think uh, we'll probably just have Ms. Poole come forward and give us the highlights uh, of that before we uh, entertain a motion and entertain questions. Welcome. Good evening, Your Worship. <clears throat> Your personnel committee at its meeting held on the 9th day of May 2022 begs leave to report as follows and submits recommendations where deemed necessary and expedient. The purpose of the meeting was to discuss the tentative agreement with the Brandon Professional Firefighters and Paramedics Association, Local 803. Negotiations commenced in December of 2021, with the settlement being reached on May 9th, 2022, which was ratified by the union membership on June 7th, 2022. The negotiated settlement is within mandate and highlights include general wage increases, very similar to the 911 settlement, January 1st, 2022 of 1.25%, 1 July 1st of the same year, 1.25%, January 1st, 2023, 1.25%, and July of the same year, 1.25%, January 1st of 2024, 1.25%, and July 1st of 2024, 1.25%. There's also a 55 cent increase to shift, dif shift differential for night shifts, a cost sharing agreement for a joint health and wellness program, a cost sharing agreement for the new paramedic license fees, and it's a three year contract set to expire on December 31st, 2024. The proposed settlement is now being presented to City Council for consideration and decision, inclusive of, of administration's recommendation as follows that the City of Brannan enter into a three-year agreement with the Brannan Professional Firefighters and Paramedics Association, Local 803, for the period of January 1st, 2022 to December 31st, 2024, as per the Memorandum of Settlement, whereby general wages shall be increased as follows. January 1st of 2022, 1.25%, and again, July 1st of that year, 1.25%, and the same in the following two years. So it's a three-year deal with 1.25 on January 1st and 1.25 on July 1st of all three years. Very good, thank you very much. Comprehensive report and we'll open up for questions starting with Councillor DeJarley. Thank you to your worship to uh, the presenter. Uh, thanks for the work. It's great that we have something here negotiating good faith and everybody agreeing to it. Um, one of the interesting things that we noticed or that I noticed is, you know, the, the six month intervals and the increases. And so just wondering how, um, how often we do that and what the actual annual percentage increase is, because it's not 2.5, it's certainly significantly less than that. So maybe you can touch on that. Through your worship to Councillor DeJarley, it's, uh, it averages to 1.88%. Um, we, we don't these don't do these all the time the, the union, unions usually like to do the the full year increases but honestly this was a result of some pretty good conversations with the union where they were willing to work with us they have some pretty significant cost of living concerns we have some pretty significant budget concerns um, you know it was somewhere we were able to land almost you know somewhere in the middle uh, that was palatable to both sides I think the last time we did one was with transit in uh, 20. 
13. It was a mid-year increase. For my time. No, no. It was last meeting. <laughs> it was last meeting we did one. No, um, yes, aside from 911, sorry. Okay, other questions? Didn't have any other hands up, so. Councilor Fawcett, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, through Your Worship, and I, I'm glad Councilor Desarly did ask that because it wasn't too common, but it is, I guess, it's the same negotiating group from last meeting, so it, it, it wasn't a surprise. 1.88 is a manageable amount uh, uh, through the year. Uh, we can live with that. I'm always happy when I can see us negotiate and come to an agreement, so I think that that's good, and I hope going forward we can continue to do those sort of things. Um, so. Thank you on behalf of yourself and uh, and the union for trying to consider the city as well as their well-being in all of this. So, well done. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I think that has it covered. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cool. And what is council's wish? Uh, motion would be in order. Councilor Jarley, do you want to take it? Yeah, thank you, through Your Worship. I move that the City of Brandon enter into a three-year agreement with the VPFFPA Local 803 for the period of January 1st, 2022 to December 31st, 2024, as per the Memorandum of Settlement, whereby general rate wages shall be increased as follows. January 1st, 2022, 1.25. July 1st, 2022, 1.25. January 1st, 2023, 1.25. July 1st, 2023, 1.25. January 1st, 2024, 1.25. And July 1st, 2024, 1.25. Thank you. Seconder, please. Councillor Cullen, whoever wishes to speak. Any other uh, discussion? I will uh, weigh in then if uh, no other councillors are, are going to uh, and, uh, echo some of the previous comments made. Uh, again, I think this is a, a very suitable agreement. Uh, like others have mentioned, it's always certainly very good for the organization on both sides when we can have a you know, voluntarily uh, negotiated agreement that everybody can mutually agree to. It certainly does provide uh, you know, additional sort of labor management uh, piece. And so I, I do credit, uh, you know, all parties involved in this uh, from uh, Human Resources Department, obviously management of the uh, fire service and then the uh, fire association itself for uh, really playing ball together and uh, coming up with a, uh, with a reasonable agreement. And uh, again, I think that uh, it, it, uh, it's an important group. All of our groups are, you know, this particular group uh, uh, has had a lot of pressures on it uh, over the last, uh, a uh, while and uh, not necessarily easing. So uh, we appreciate the fact that we can get this uh, negotiated uh, settlement. And then finally, um, just on a much broader basis, uh, um, many of us around the table have been uh, associated with this for about eight years, some even uh, longer. And uh, in the success of two terms of council, at least uh, uh, I've been mayor, I think we can be quite proud of our labor management record. Uh, you know, we haven't had any strike or lockout or arbitration or, you know, significant uh, uh, labor disruption at all. Uh, so I, I think it really does show a good atmosphere of, of working together. Not to say obviously that we agree on everything all the time and, you know, there are wrinkles that have to be worked out, you know, even in between agreements obviously, but uh, generally speaking, uh, uh, we're in pretty good shape and you know I, I do fully credit to all the people involved again from our uh, director of human resources and then all of the groups uh, uh, that are involved and you know it's hard work at those negotiating uh, tables and uh, really pleases me that uh, we can get to the finish line in a, in a very uh, appropriate manner so just wanted to put those comments in uh, Councillor Fawcett uh, yeah excellent uh, thank you through your worship um, one thing I do want to make note of as well here is uh, just because of the, the, uh, the group that we're working with there is uh, we did a little bit of a Band-Aid job over the budget on uh, the ambulance service. And so we do want to continue to have our management team and our political team pressing the province and uh, shared health to come to some kind of better solution for the long term for our, our, our residents. So. Uh, that is an important part that we need to play in, in sort of helping that whole situation. 
So yes, if we can openly that. say that we're continuing to work on that. It's a significant province-wide consideration. Obviously, you know, we're most concerned about our kind of piece of the puzzle, our corner of the, uh, of the and again, we're trying to work, uh, you know, with the association on that. Um, it, uh, you know, obviously would have had, you know, some effect on the negotiations, but again, I, I credit everybody for sort of rising above that much bigger picture situation and, you know, making sure that we got this done and then, you know, together we can continue to work on, on that. So thanks for raising that, Councilor Fawcett. Any other comments in before we call the question? Seeing none, call the question then. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ms. Poole and Deputy Chief Parlow as well. So, on to our next item, please. Also under committee reports, we have a verbal report from the Poverty Committee. And Councillor Lupke. Yep. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, our Poverty Committee did meet on Jan uh, June the 8th. Uh, we, uh, before we began our meeting, we toured the Brandon Food Rescue Grocery Store, which is located at 719 Rosser Avenue. The Food Rescue Grocery is on a mission to save 100,000 pounds of food from the landfill this year and appear to be well on their way as they have already passed the 60,000 mark. The store's mission statement is at Food Rescue Grocery Store, we think good food should stay out of the landfill. So we're bringing a new brand and approach to food security, providing rescued food at a low price for all. Come visit us in person and save something delicious today. The food at the store isn't collected by any other social agencies and would be composted or sent to a landfill because it is deemed access by its makers. They do not compete with other nonprofits for donations, but instead seek out food that is not being donated and bring it into our community for distribution. And current hours for the store are Thursday and Friday from 3 to 6 p.m., Saturday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., and Sunday from 1 to 3 p.m. Uh, in addition to the tour, we did get an update on the Community Indicator System website that was being built through the United Way. Council may uh, remember that our Poverty Committee contributed financially to the United Way to help build that uh, website. I believe it was $5,000 that we provided to them. The CIS, the Community Indicator System, will be live as of this evening. They were going to launch it as part of their annual meeting tonight. Uh, it was always a work in progress as more information is gathered and we'll be adding a bit more in-depth Indigenous component once their Indigenous Advisory Council starts their work. The website address is brandon.tracking-progress.org. The committee also provided feedback to Brandon Transit about the current report being prepared to offer low-income fares or passes for Brandon Transit and we continue to look at supporting a community wellness event in our city this fall. Uh, stay tuned for more details once we have some firmer plans developed on that. Thank you very much. Great report. Any uh, questions of Councillor Lupke or any other members of the uh, Poverty Committee on that report? Uh, looks like it has it covered. Thank you very much. And next, please. I believe we have a verbal report from the Brandon Police Board. Councillor Barry. Yes, thank you, Worship. <coughs> I'm happy to... Uh, present from our last meeting on June 10th, the Brandon Police Board meeting, uh, which I sit on along with uh, His Worship uh, Mayor Crest, fellow Councillor Barry Collin, and as an ex officio, our City Manager Ron Bowles. Uh, at this meeting, we had the uh, luxury of having a presentation by our two uh, Brandon Police Service School Resource Officers who serve in both the uh, kindergarten to grade 8 schools and the high schools grade 9 to 12 in Brandon here, and they were Constable Jason Medvichuk and Constable uh, Moshi Lunov. Uh, they presented uh, on different aspects of the duties they do there, the calls they have to deal with while well in the high schools, uh, other interactions they have with the students and with the teachers and that. It was actually a very, very thorough, very educating uh, presentation. And, uh, and the job these guys do in the high schools is, is like phenomenal because uh, it's a lot of things that we don't realize that's going on uh, outside of the streets and in the schools and that that they're taking care of. And, and, a lot of letters of support and praise came in from both parents and schools in, in situations in dealing with the kids and that. And, and again, it was a very, very good presentation and hopefully someday in the future uh, they can come and, and do this presentation towards all the council so they can see what these uh, school yeah. resource officers are providing as a service. So, Along with that, we had our uh, report from the Chief of Police on his activities uh, for the first four months of the year. As usual, he's kept very, very busy with meetings, both with the province and with the city and with other uh, interactions with uh, 
committees and that throughout the city and that, so I won't go through all of them because his list is always about a page and a half long of meetings. We keep him very busy. Also at the meeting in that, uh, a financial summary, which I'll update here in a sec, and there was also an update given by Chief Balkan on the permanent detention center bill, which now a tender will be going out for, and I believe it's June 23rd is when we will hear back on, on who we get in that as well. So uh, you also touched briefly on the downtown strategy and downtown wellness and safety task force, which we've had talks about here before with our committee. Uh, we did have a bit of discussion after a brief presentation from Chief Balkan on the image capturing devices and legislation. So there was a brief discussion within the board at that time. And we were also presented at the time with an update on the Branham Police Board Policy by one of our committee members, board members, who gave it to uh, the rest of board members for us to look at before our next meeting in September in case there's any changes or um, additions, deletions they want to make to that. So. So just going back to the financial budget part of the police, at this time the police service is projecting a deficit of $72,139 for 2022. Uh, this is comprised of uh, 3,300 and a bit in operating costs and 68,000 deficit in the police vehicle costing center. Um, most of the increase or the deficit, uh, the, the expenses of 53,000 are because of the increase of fuel. Surprise, surprise, there we go. It's, you know, it's the fuel costs are, are really hurting all operations in the city of police is no exception. Um, costs arising with police services to transport the prisoners, and we've had this discussion before, to the Winnipeg Remand Center amounted to about $24,677 in 2022. The good news here um, is that uh, Brandon Correctional Institute is taking back that responsibility, so the police will not be doing that anymore going forward. And that's actually good news that we will not have our officers having to transport prisoners into the Remand Center from here. That'll fall back to them, so. Currently, the police service is projected to have attained approximately 70% of the vacancy management target, management target for 2022 of 325,000. And the last bit I'm gonna share with you is the total number of calls, which I always am interested in. The total number of calls received in the first four months of this year was 11,429, which includes 78 bylaw rated calls and 427 animal control calls. This is an average call of 122 per sworn officer in the first four months. So we can expect that we're gonna be hitting close to 500 calls per officer again this year if things keep going. Summer's always seems to be the, the busiest time. So, and that's my report I wish to submit. Excellent report, uh, Councillor Barry. And we'll uh, open the floor for questions uh, anybody might have of uh, Councillor Barry's report from the police board. Councillor DeJar. Thank you, Three Worship. Not, uh, the report directly, but um, we had, you know, last year, and um, you know, we're coming out of a pandemic. But last year, we've had a, a resident um, connect with some of a, a council and, and uh, maybe a few others regarding um, when we exercise a, a search warrant, uh, some of the damage that can happen to properties, and one of the ideas. Um, that sort of started to percolate was the possibility of using um, property forfeitures or, or crime um, forfeiture uh, to help compensate victims of crime and considering landlords or property managers as victims of crime in this case. I'm just wondering if there's been any discussion about that uh, and if it's something that the board would uh, entertain um, in the next few months to look at it. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Zarley. I'm, I'm not in a position to answer that question, but through your worship, but with your grace, if you wouldn't mind, Chief Balkan is in presence here, if you wouldn't mind just coming up and speaking on that, about the forfeitures of crime and what the money can be used for, the things we can use it for and can't for, based on that question. Sorry to put you on the spot, Chief. But. Thank, Thank you, your worship, through you to Council. Um, good question, however, uh, the Criminal property forfeiture fund is for victims of crime, and a lot of times uh, the city has their own insurance uh, to deal with issues that involve uh, liability when, when the police are um, using force to enter a property. So right now we have um, uh, that service provided through city legal and through uh, risk management. I don't believe this would fall into that because they're not a direct victim of the crime. Yeah, thank you, Three Wish. So I guess that's what I was wondering is what is actually under our purview as BPS or the city, do we have to go by 
uh, a provincial definition of who a victim of crime is, or are we allowed to recognize that you know a landlord, a property owner who is renting to somebody who might be you know in criminal activity, and you're exercising a search warrant, which is completely legal, and so there will be no ability for that landlord or property manager to you know get covered through insurance because we're exercising a search warrant in a legal way they're left holding the bag and having to go after their tenant Correct. who is I, i'm just curious how often they get the money back from the tenant who's facing criminal charges and you know drug related stuff and so i'm just wondering about how we might be able to work with our community our landlords our property managers to recognize that they are impacted by this crime indirectly potentially a victim of the crime as well and ways for us to work with them so that they're not afraid to work with bps or anybody else and exercising warrants or let, you know finding out if there's a tenant there you know because you want our we i think we want property managers and landlords to work with us when we're trying to exercise these things so uh, through your your worship to uh, councillor de we certainly want uh, to have that impact on the community however it's not an area where I would be willing to discuss at all with landlords because it's a judicially authorized search warrant and a lot of times it's it's done through uh, sessions with the judiciary and it's kept in private so I don't want to work with uh, not that I don't want to work with them yeah. but uh, it, it would put us the police in a bad spot to, to talk to a landlord and say we're going to do a search warrant could we get a key I don't know their connection with the people that are living there I don't know their connection with okay. uh, whoever's there so it, it would put our investigations in jeopardy to answer your other question regarding victims there is a provincial definition under under the victim services and under criminal property forfeiture I'm sure they would have their own definition of victims of crime um, what the city does uh, if they were to do that would be up to the city and I'm through I'm sure through uh, risk management and legal that would come into their uh, purview okay. I'm still a little I appreciate the answer I guess I'm just a little um, unclear who would make the decision to look at something like that would it be the police board or would it be City Council and I guess that'd be, is this something that we can Maybe, have a um, look into? Maybe it's a little complicated, so why don't we take that under advisement through the city manager and uh, even through the chief, and then our, our probably it'll, it'll involve our legal and risk management departments. So there's probably quite a few mo moving parts, so I think it would be best to handle it that way and let the city manager navigate that. I think he understands what you're, I think we all certainly know what the issue is and that there are people that sort of our unwitting victim, so to speak, if, if not that perfect uh, uh, description or definition, but they end up, as you call it, holding the bag. Mm -hmm. So we can look into it further. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Any other uh, questions of Councilor Barry's uh, uh, police board report? We do have Deb Arpin here. I can get her up too to speak on something now that she's in the <laughs> audience. So might as well get everybody involved, so. Chair of the police board. Any other questions? Thank you very much for that, Councillor Barry. Uh, those are the reports we were aware of, but sometimes there are other committees that have uh, met and would like to report, and we'd be glad to take them now. <coughs> Not seeing any others. A uh, motion to receive the uh, poverty. Do we also have to include the uh, personnel we committee? No, we've already. Okay. It's okay. So uh, to receive the uh, poverty and police board committee reports. Motion, please. Moved by Councillor Barry, seconded by Councillor Lupke. Any discussion? Call for the question then. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Thank you. Next item, please. The order of inquiries, Your Worship. We may or may not have any, but yeah. well, there was one that came in, but you weren't sure if you were going to raise it. It's up to you, Councillor. Well, through, through Your Worship, uh, it was about the, the weather and, uh, and getting the mosquitoes spraying going on things. And uh, since I put that in, Councillor Barry, uh, has made a more aggressive approach that I agree with, and so we're going to talk about it on the agenda later. Yeah, and I'll say this, that the response that um, would have been replied has got good information, and we'll probably touch on some of that information in, in that in discussion. That yeah, so, so that'll good. be helpful. Yeah. So. OK, 
Okay, uh, that said, uh, that was the only inquiry we were aware of, but others do arise. So, Councilor Barry? Yes, thank you, Sorry, Sorry, I did not have uh, an opportunity to get this one in today, and I know that I will not get an answer tonight either. It will be taken under advisement. I do ask, if possible, to have it back before our next meeting, though. Uh, currently, uh, Marquis Drive is under construction to have the re re uh, street reconstructed because of damage done, wear and tear, a lot of heavy uh, construction vehicles in that area where the developments are going on. Um, they're getting near completion, and this was a, a conversation we had a couple months ago with some members of engineering, traffic, and, and actually the Brandon Police Service uh, sergeant at the time. The residents are wondering, and so am I, that once the street is actually rebuilt at the cost of several hundred thousand dollars, if the city is going to look at putting some restricted load signs on that road so that the heavy trucks, construction trucks, and that cannot drive down there is kind of a shortcut between, uh, basically, between Battlefield and, and uh, Brookwood is what they were using it for because we're spending a lot of money to fix it and the last thing we need is all these vehicles to come back on there again and start ripping it up again so uh, the point was made in our meeting I'd like to know if the city is going to be doing something uh, whether enforcement wise or sign wise for load limits types of vehicles whatever the citizens are just looking for something uh, hopefully to come back on that because again nobody wants to see the street have to be done again in two in two years yeah. just because okay. of the traffic so well, good. I think we, we'll uh, take that under advisement. Uh, again, I think uh, engineering and our transportation <coughs> department is really well aware of what you're driving at there, and you know have the data and have an understanding of that, so they'll they'll uh, know what uh, what the inquiry is about. Thank you. And any other inquiries that uh, came in late? All right. Not seeing any other. Next item, please. The order of announcements, Your Worship. Announcements this evening. Councillor Jarley. Thank you to your worship. Just a friendly reminder to everyone that tomorrow is uh, National Indigenous Peoples Day uh, and there are celebrations happening uh, tomorrow at the Riverbank Discovery Centre from around 12 right through 9 p.m. There'll be lots of um, stuff for the kids to do throughout the day. Uh, lots of displays, crafts, food, entertainment, uh, rounding out the evening with um, Indian City and Don Omero closing out the night. So hopefully the weather uh, holds and uh, we're able to, to celebrate. And you know, tomorrow is about being grateful for the sun, right? Being grateful for, this, for the summer that we're eventually going to, uh, to, to experience here together. And, um, and you know, the, the, the joy of, uh, of living uh, on the prairies with, uh, with uh, summer coming on uh, with our First Nation Métis and Inuit brothers and sisters. So uh, hopefully we can get out and celebrate with them tomorrow from 12 to 9 at the Riverbank Discovery Centre. Thank you, uh, Councillor Dujarle. And the, a lot of activities within the entertainment lineup uh, is phenomenal. So it's, uh, I understand there's no charge for this. It's a, just a great evening, uh, a great day out. So thank you. Other announcements? <coughs> Sorry, through your worship, yep. uh, Councillor Fawcett did remind me to, to tell everybody to bring their own chair tomorrow. Right. <laughs> and uh, I'll toss in a couple. Uh, just before our, our meeting, I, I was at the uh, Commonwealth Air Training Plan Museum for a reception, really sort of uh, Travel Manitoba Board of Directors is in Brandon hosting their board meeting. So they uh, started it off with a reception at, at one of our top tourist attractions since they're in that business and they've actually created a, a uh, it's called Manitoba Flight Pass. They've kind of combined together three uh, air museums, um, uh, including ours, into a kind of a collection of uh, um, and a marketing effort to, towards that. So very fitting that they had their opening reception at the uh, Commonwealth Air Training Plan Museum. So we do welcome the Travel Manitoba Board to Brandon. Certainly, uh, we're an important part of that. And uh, next to that, I did, as I promised, I would do be a broken record to uh, remind people that October 26th is uh, uh, elections for uh, municipal and school boards. So the offices of uh, school trustees, uh, city councilors, and mayor of our uh, community um, will be up for election on October uh, 26th, and I believe as of Wednesday, that's 18 weeks away. So, I mean, it is uh, closing in on, uh, on everyone, and we would highly encourage people to become engaged in the process at whatever level they are comfortable in. Consider being a candidate for any of the three 
um, positions that uh, are available. Um, if not, help another candidate and uh, just pay attention to what's going on and, you know, best of all, make sure that you get out and vote on October 26. Once again, I always volunteer current councillors. I'm sure the school trustees would feel the same way that people out there that may have a bit of interest but want more information. I'm sure any city councillor would be glad to uh, take your call and provide you with uh, some information on what it's uh, like while you sit here and watch us meet till late in the evenings and feel, holy moly, that looks like a handful. It's very rewarding work. Uh, it's important to our community and uh, we really need the uh, engagement of, uh, of a diverse, good group of uh, people running for all these positions. So I promised I was gonna keep this up and I will not let you down. So any other announcements that may have come to mind? Councilor Jarley. Thank you, that's exactly what happened. It did come to mind after he's, uh, he mentioned bring your own chair because Councilor Dejarle is also having a ward meeting on June 28th, 6.30 at Park Community Center, hopefully on the grounds there, uh, weather permitting, and it's another bring your own chair event. Uh, so we'll be talking about the city plan, some of the events that are happening downtown, uh, update on the outdoor sports uh, facility, and it should have all the world's problems solved by around 8, 39 o'clock. So be good for that. Okay, not seeing any other announcements. I think we can move on to the next item, please. Under the order of general business, Your Worship, we have uh, the request for settlement assistance from the Ukrainian Canadian Association, TRIZIP. Thank you. So um, um, Sandra Trudell has put this uh, report together as, as always. It's uh, very comprehensive, does provide some uh, um, options for council to consider. And uh, Ms. Trudell is, is on teams available. She felt in light of the uh, fairly full agenda that we have, she wouldn't have to make a presentation when it's already in front of us, but certainly would be available to answer questions. I've got a few thoughts on it myself, but we'll open the floor to any, um, I guess, Initial questions, if you had any. If not, you know we're happy to take a motion. But, um, I'm not sure how council wants to handle it. If there are not any uh, questions emerging. Um, um, I think Sandy has kind of laid out, you know, the, the possibility. As, as we recall, the Trizub um, group did attend to a council meeting uh, a number of weeks back. Um, indicating some city services and facilities and resources, I guess, that the city has that it would be helpful to be able to avail themselves of uh, when they begin to uh, uh, settle uh, people that are having to flee uh, Ukraine. And uh, so uh, administration has kind of put this together. Um, uh, personally, I, I, I think that um, the needs that they have were things like the resources such as, you know, bus passes, uh, recreation passes for families, uh, possibly criminal record checks, you know, the things that are, that are under the city jurisdiction that we would normally charge for. Uh, then they were going to be seeking the other levels of government <coughs> uh, for the areas that they would charge for. One of the uh, recommendations would be just to provide an outright grant of $10,000 to Westman Immigrant Services which they would presumably use to buy some of those back from us. And I, I'm not sure that's, I, I'm kind of mindful of the fact that we've, we've had other, I, I guess uh, this isn't the correct term, but I'll, I'll use it, uh, you know, kind of refugee uh, situations. We will have more of them moving forward. You know, not always as, uh, as large of, uh, as a situation as the, as the Ukraine, um, invasion but they're significant to those cultures of those countries when when they occur and uh, it would seem appropriate to sort of establish this possibility this precedent that you know council uh, would be amenable to consider you know gifting contributing those services and resources that we do have that they need such as the bus passes recreation passes and the like so I would think that a, a possibility would be for us to uh, um, agree to contribute our, uh, these resources 
up to a maximum of $10,000, and our administration can um, figure out the, the sort of back uh, office portions of that. Uh, you know, it might be Westman Immigrant Services that need to make the contact or tries of need to make the contact, but then at least we're not billing back and so on and so forth. Uh, it occurred to me that the, our various departments involved would have a charge code after if council approves this. I'm not sure, Mr. Manager, if that's kind of the way uh, it seems to work around here, that uh, if you go to transit and they need transit passes for you know a dozen people that have just arrived, they can just easily hand out the passes charge it off to a charge code and it's kind of a done deal. So that was kind of my thinking on that. Uh, along the lines of the magnitude of what uh, Mr. Trudell is uh, indicating uh, as an upset <coughs> limit and we make it fairly straightforward uh, that way that, that those kind of resources that uh, we have that they need can be easily availed uh, and contributed by the city. Uh, uh, Councilor Angie? Your Worship, I will abstain my vote on this due to the nature of my work. Thank you. Um, <coughs> so any other thoughts from Council? Councilor Lupke? Thank you, Worship. I, I, uh, I think this is a difficult one, not in the sense of whether to support or not, but I am mindful of the report by Mr. Trudell regarding the need of administrative time and effort to do the option that you suggested about um, you know the bus passes and rec passes and those kind of things and I wonder if just a overall grant would ease that administrative part away from our city staff uh, to a third party if that would be more beneficial to do it that way with our staff and I wonder if, if Ms. Trudell is there maybe she could speak to that specifically yeah she or? probably can and I think you know the city our city manager obviously that has to have a view of the whole organization might have a comment on on this it just seemed to me that either way somebody's got to call up the transit department they got to issue transit passes and uh, you know if if it's coming then we would be billing back to say Westman immigrant services it occurred yeah. to me that it was more administration. I guess I was more concerned with the fact, sorry, Your Worship, uh, through you, is uh, the processes need to be established than from our city staff, not just the actual pass part. Yeah. So that's probably where my concern is about how to develop the processes and how long that will take and how much time and effort that takes. Yeah. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Bowles or Ms. Trudell. I think you understand the confusion or the, the uh, yeah, I could probably, probably take a start a stab at it here and then uh, if uh, mr. Yell has something to add uh, she will uh, from her online location uh, we're not talking about a material amount of staff time but yes this is this is uh, extraordinary to what we normally do anything that's extraordinary takes more takes more time um, the uh, you know uh, an out outright grant is much easier to administer um, for us to, to manage this, whether it's through Westman Immigration, as the, the mayor suggested, or we just do it, you know, in our transit department and the different departments. It is, it is more onerous. We're not talking about a huge um, amount of inconvenience, um, but there is, there is some impact, absolutely. So I'm not sure if Sandy's on the line. Oh, there she is. So if you had anything to add to that? Through your worship. Uh, yes, the, the only, I guess, consideration that Council would need to factor in with the scenario that uh, you've been discussing this evening is whether you wish to restrict the funds that the city contributes only to services provided by the city. Um, if that is the intent, then obviously um, staff can put those processes in place. Um, as Councillor Lubke mentioned, though, it is more than just setting up a, uh, a charge code. We would need to set up um, verification processes, uh, how it's going to flow from Westman Immigrant Services to each department. Uh, so there is a bit of work involved there. But as the city manager indicated, uh, it is certainly something that staff um, 
can do if that is the wish of council, but it certainly would be more onerous than what an outright grant. So it's really two distinctions there um, is, are the funds to only be used for city delivered services, or are we providing a grant that will also potentially fill some other gaps of those newcomers that are arriving? Thank you, uh, Councilor Fawcett. Yeah, thank you through your worship. Uh, I, I, I'm supportive of just the grant going out there a little bit. Hopefully it's a one-time thing because I hope some of this is resolved over the next short while. Um, it, it is a federal thing. Again, the federal government's involved in a lot of this. And, and it's always slippery when we start getting into to other jurisdictions um, and and also uh, you know it, there's a lot of refugees that come through our uh, and, and so let's face facts Ukrainian uh, in Brandon is a is a like we, we have our history this is a this is a, a stronghold here we, we have a whole little Ukraine you know versus uh, some other places and I think it's really important and we're very aware of everything that's going on there federal government is really involved um, West Bend Immigrant Service is a very well run operation and I, I would feel comfortable with them managing it as best needed I know there's a little bit of difference with some of the other refugees like that, that some of these uh, are not necessarily under refugee status under the circumstances, and so that is a bit of a difference than than, than regular. So there is some logistics here that maybe this this would help them out a little bit as a bit of a bridge. But uh, it is a federal government uh, thing. Um, we welcome all immigrants and refugees. We try to make things as good for everybody. Uh, at best, I'd say we could do a grant and West Man Immigrant Services uses it to do the best things that they can do to, to make it work. And then, of course, all our departments are going to be working with them all the time. We already do uh, work with the immigrant services and that. So hopefully we can, we can do more. This is maybe a symbolic piece on the city of Brandon's part. It's not a huge, huge dollar amount. As a matter of fact, much more has been raised locally. So it is just a symbolic contribution on the behalf of the city to help transition this and um, fortunately well I say fortunately but my friend Sunday has a bit of an idea on some of this uh, on what it's like to have to be a refugee and uh, we don't want to have to imagine that so th th those first months I, are quite quite the thing any little help is, is good so easiest I think kind of like Councillor Luke, Luke you were saying just grant Immigrant services can handle that. Yeah, uh, Councillor Shaboy. Uh, thank you, Worship. Yeah, I support um, what Councillor Fawcett and Luke are saying too about uh, um, letting the experts do the job. And I think that Westman Immigrant Services are experts in understanding the basic needs, and the basic needs would probably go beyond some of the the amenities that the city would offer. Um, you know, for example, they were saying about short-term daycare or it might be even a basic piece of clothing. Who knows? You know, there's so many basic needs for people that are coming that have nothing. And so I think I, I agree that I think option three mentions that, that it would be used, uh, you know, at their discretion and on an individual basis. And uh, it's just, it's, I would support that. And Councillor Lupke. Thank you, Worship. I would make that motion. Okay, go ahead. It's okay. probably the motion that's listed on the agenda then. I would move that the City of Brandon provide Westman Immigrant Services a grant of $10,000 to assist with basic settlement needs, not permanent residence related costs of Ukrainians arriving via CUAET and refugees who have been in Brandon for less than 12 months who are not federally sponsored with funds provided via the 2022 grants review budget. Further, that city staff be authorized to execute the necessary funding agreement and reporting process related to the grant. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor DeJarley. Move over to speak. No, I, I think Councillor Fawcett said it very well, and I just believe this is kind of the cleanest way to, uh, to 
to make a contribution and uh, and Westman Immigrant Services, as uh, Jeff said, is kind of trained in, in doing this and will do a great job in getting those funds to the people that need it the most. Yep. Any other Councillor Cole? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I don't believe that the citizens of Brandon would have any problem with what we're attempting to do here right now. And uh, with this small amount of money, it uh, gives uh, Westman Immigrant Services maybe just a little bit more uh, the ability to react uh, for needs that are sometimes just unexpected. Uh, that, uh, you know, something needs to be done, whether it be purchasing medication or purchasing something that ne needs to be done just without having to jump through a bunch of hoops. Um, I would like to see, uh, however, a little bit of accountability just to the point that after when this was done that we could maybe get a report back through uh, to uh, economic development and through Sandy as far as where the money was used and uh, uh, therefore that would help us in the future if uh, this were to come back to uh, become a precedent setting thing. So um, I'm not sure if you need to have a, a a little bit of an amendment in there to say that the reporting would be coming back or or not. Madam Clerk, the presumed agreement might do that. Um, I mean, that could be the directive, but if, if you want to ensure that that happens, you might want to add that as an amendment. Are you happy with the way that it reads that it would be, the accountability piece would be installed? I think that kind of gets deferred to the city. Well, a portion of the motion does say for the city staff be authorized to execute the necessary agreement, you know, and yes. they would have the ability to put those kind of details into it. So, Good. just as long as my intent is known, that's great. Thank you. Yes. If I may, you were, I would just add that, you know, I, I look at it, it is kind of following the same process through the grants review committee, and part of that is that they do report back on what they use the funds for. So, I assume that same process would, would be in effect for this. Good point. Any other discussion? Seeing none, call for the question then. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. And uh, noted that uh, Councillor Frangi uh, recused himself from that uh, discussion and voting. Thank you. And next item, please. Is the amendment to resolution number 1127 regarding Park Community Centre. And I would note that this motion was tabled at the April 19th meeting. And so we will need a motion to to uh, take that motion from the table for consideration, that pending motion. Okay. Councilor, moved by Councilor DeJarley, seconded by Councilor Cullen. This is a motion to just remove it from the table and right. put it back on this table. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. So that means we're back to the original motion that was uh, 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 moved on uh, in April. Um, that's listed on the agenda, and we could take it from there. Um, Councilor Jarley, go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. I move that Council Resolution Number 1127, related to the issuance of a request for proposals for Park Community Center, adopted at the July 12, 2021 meeting as City Council, be amended by deleting the words "repair," "upgrade," or "replacement" of Park Community Center and substituting therefore the words demolition and replacement of Park Community Centre. And that the issuance of a request for proposals for the design build that's of a new Park Community Centre. Oh, that's the second one. Hang on. Yes, that would be a separate motion. Sorry. Okay, so we'll just deal with that. Seconder for that first chunk, Councillor Cullen. Whoever wish to speak. So through your worship, I'm just wondering about how we want to um, move forward with this and whether this would be a time for us to hear from anybody from administration. I believe so. Was somebody planning on uh, making a presentation? Uh, no, Your Worship, we were not planning to make a presentation, but uh, we have city staff that are absolutely available to answer questions. Right. Yeah, through Your Worship, I think it would be good for public to hear from administration because we really act, we haven't actually had any of this presented to the public in a city council meeting here. I know that administration has done some due, to due diligence and has reached out to the Park Community Centre Board, but we still haven't done this in public. So. Yeah, so we could have a bit of a 
update, uh, I suppose, of the process, Mr. Uh, Bolts? Uh, yeah, so um, I, I believe uh, Mr. Rock is the, is the author of this report, and so he'd be happy to answer questions. However, I, I will make a note that um, since uh, Council last put this on the table, uh, Director of Engineering, who's looking at building this project, because that's what we're seeing it now as a building project, um, so the Director of Engineering and myself have met on numerous occasions with the Park Community Centre Board, uh, had lots of back and forth discussions about how to, to best utilize that site and, and how to uh, develop the best um, uh, community centre for the, for the community and for downtown. Um, and so we've come to some agreements. Uh, I think Mr. Allard has put those in this report. So I just want to let you know that uh, um, I'm just trying to let Perry off the hook here a little bit to <laughs> let you know that it was Mr. Uh, Allard and myself that uh, and he's on vacation right now. We want to get going on this project. We would, if council is interested in doing it, we would like to do the tender for the design build this fall so that we can, um, they can start construction next year if that's council's wishes. So that's why we wanted to um, go forward. It's just a very quick vacation. point of just, uh, if RFP, not tender, because there's a bit of difference, right? We're doing an RFP on this? Uh, neither. It would be a design build nope. contract. Okay, I'm going to let Perry talk about that then. It is an RFP. For design build. Yeah. Yeah. The RFP for design build, yeah. Okay, Mr. Rock, come on ahead and uh, give us uh, once around the kitchen on this one. And uh, we've had many uh, sessions on this, so just a, a good summary would be great. Sure. Good evening, Your Worship. So as Ron pointed out, since the April 19th meeting, we have had many uh, meetings with the administration and the Parks uh, Community Centre Board to talk about that facility. And both parties have come to the agreement that repairs to Park Community Centre are not good value for money. All right, uh, and we see a high risk for a creep in cost as we get into repairing that old building. So the parties have worked together to ensure that a new building uh, should meet uh, the needs of the community. And its administration's recommendation is that the current recommendation is that council approve the issuance of a request for proposal for the design build of a new com uh, park community center. And the floor plan should be sufficient to accommodate the 140 people uh, in the event and space uh, should have identified basic amenities that will ensure the community center can function. Okay, that's uh, short and sweet, so we'll open for questions then. I think, um, again, just dialing back, um, a similar recommendation was, was uh, presented to Council probably in April. Then there was an interest to include not only the potential to build a new one, but the possibility of repairing, upgrading the old one. And then we got further engineers involved and coming to the sort of stark conclusion that it just was very difficult, costly, and um, high risk for it to greatly exceed estimated costs. So our administration, I know of the Park Community Centre Board and community group have been very good at meeting very frequently, as I understanding, with our administration, and they worked through it together you know we've always wanted this to be obviously a, a you know community engaged project I mean this is a this is a you know by its very name it's a community center and we need the uh, the uh, community to be in, engaged in in the uh, project and I understand it's got to that Park Community Center board has um, a great vision significant ideas for you know what can come of this and the the uh, um, community that it will create and they've indicated in the report that they're also very respectful of the, um, the costing and the, the uh, fin financial commitment that's uh, required and you know wanting to uh, keep it in line as much as possible you know, and they're proposing to I think um, do some of the things uh, afterward some of the furnishings appliances and those kind of things is understanding that they've got visions for uh, you know kind of um, getting the community going and I think that you know there would be uh, 
significant interest in helping out to really uh, put all the finishing touches on this thing. So uh, I think it was, a, in the end, a, a very good process, and I credit the, the board for uh, being that uh, enlightened and, and working with, with our administration and, and back and forth on that regard. So, so uh, questions of Mr. Rock or of the process? Councillor Barry. Thank you, Worship. <clears throat> so in consideration of this motion and the amendment, Perry, I'm assuming then this would be put into the 2023 budget with the new council because, of course, we've budgeted nothing for for any kind of a new build, but but basically just for 500 demolition. Through you, Your Worship, to Councillor Barry. Yes, that's correct. We need to do some. The, the RFP needs to go out. We, once we have that information coming back, then we'd be able to know how much we need. We know we have some money in the budget, but not enough money to necessarily build it, or we may have enough money. But we won't know that till we get the RFPs back. Thanks. Councillor Fawcett and Councillor Parker. Yeah, thank you. Just again, through your worship. So just kind of going uh, 180 here. The recommendation originally was from the department to Take down that, and we have a, we had a plan to do green space development and park space development. But now the recommendation from council, or from not from council, but from from the, the department, is 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 to to build a new one. So we've gone sort of a 180 on recommendation to so from staff. Administration came to council. You call with the recommendation to demolish it, turn into green space. Council did not accept that. Council put forward the motion to uh, uh, build, well, we had a motion yeah. to uh, put out an RFP to, first it was just to build new, based on the kind of engineering, but then and it was amended to include the possible repair. So then that set off another uh, several months of investigation and discussion, and that's what's brought us back to here. And, and, and so through, and, and in that process, so when, when I guess council asked for more information, uh, there was no road back apparently at that point. That was council's wish. Uh, like I guess the, so. The, I guess so. The recommendation to demolish was not yeah. uh, put by council. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah. Okay. This is. I mean, it's still at. open. Like we're. Yeah, we still we're still debating it. That's the whole issue. Is that we are still debating it uh, two years on. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know if council really has made much of a decision on anything here, but yeah. I, I'm just curious. That, but but we, so because of council, staff has changed from their original two years ago to two years in now, saying we should build mm -hmm. a new building. That's currently where staff, when they originally brought the information, said, no, we're going to take this down. The south end was also going down. And, and, and now we're two years in, and, and we're at a completely different, like nothing else going into any other community center, but this, the one that was going to be taken down is being rebuilt. That's where we are right now. That's the proposal. Yeah. OK. I just, it's been a weird road. It is. OK, Councillor Parker is next. Thank you, Bishop. I, we've been around and around this so many times that I'm not sure you can follow it, but Councillor Fawcett's correct. The, initial, the original recommendation from administration was to knock it down. But the part that's a little bit more concerning that, that we're even at this point is that this room, save for Councillor Frangi, unanimously adopted a community recreation plan that clearly stated after we spent a hundred thousand dollars on a study we had people come out and speak to the community at large several opportunities for that speak to all the stakeholders at all the community centers I would suggest probably park wasn't at those because they didn't have a board at the time except for two people so I don't know that they took part um, so if, to, with respect to any of the new board members, they wouldn't have been in on those discussions. That 
master plan clearly said that we had too many community centers, that we should invest money in five or six of the centers that are A, active and, and strategically located. So um, subsequent to that, one of the most strategically located was South End, and we know where it is. It's in the landfill. And so that area south of where South End one probably should be the next community center built in the city. So we're, we're flying in the face. We spend our hundred or $150,000 and a year doing a master plan together. We adopt it unanimously. We all embrace it until three months later or four months later, oh, we're all gonna change our mind because um, all of a sudden we're gonna lose a community center. So do we go through this with Central Community Center next year when it's discovered that there's an issue there? And do they get a new community center? Doesn't make sense to put it there. So I'm not sure what we're doing. Um, furthermore, I want, I want some clarification. Um, two things. The new board, good for you for stepping up now. Sadly, there was no board at that community center for a long time, and this is why we're in the, the position we're in, and that's no fault of these folks. But I don't know that the rest of the community centers in the city and the citizens of the city should bear the brunt of that. It wasn't their fault either. So one point I want clarified, if I can, and I'm not sure if it's the city manager, Madam Clerk, or we've got to go to the law firm, an RFP. So if we put out an RFP for a new build, design and built, and it comes back and it's whatever it is, looks like it's going to be a million two. What, what happens then? Does council then have to approve that we go with the RFP and then put it out for tender? Or do we have to go with the RFP? Because it's not a tender, it's an RFP. It's a difference, right? So if it comes back at $3 million, well, clearly we're not going to do it, right? That's an exaggeration. But we also thought $500,000 to fix it was an exaggeration at the start. And now it's, that's the sales tax. So we need to know what we're voting on for sure. And I'm not sure somebody can shed some light on that because it's not fair to the folks in the community center to be dangling for a year and a half or two years. It's not fair to the citizens of Brandon who have been watching this malaise for two years now. And especially to those who provided their input and got a response that we paid $100,000 for that said we don't need the community center. So it, it makes no sense. And then in the meantime, we're putting out this massive city plan. So do, like, do we change that in August? Do we, you know, once it comes out, do we change it two months later? Because it looks really silly what we're doing, to be honest. Yeah. Okay. Had it been three years from now, I understand that things change over time, right? So a five-year-old plan now, obviously we need to adjust it. But we adjusted this, we turned full circle. And I don't know, I can't remember, uh, Councillor Lubke might remember the number. It was three or four months after we adopted the plan. So just give everybody some clarity is all I'm asking here. And then we, we actually know what we're, what it is we're voting on. So I think the one thing that uh, um, will need clarification, I'm suspecting that's why Mr. Pulak has come up as the process in terms of the RFP and what our obligations are in that regard. Is that what you're coming for, Patrick? We, we do need that. So through your worship to Councillor Parker, if Council approves the resolution tonight in front of them, the intent is to issue a design build RFP outlining, based on the feedback that we've received to date, outlining exactly that, a design and construction process. So what will happen was we will, and, and within, within that RFP, it's outlined in, right in, in there, and we've had discussions with uh, our, our legal representative for the city in that if we put in there that uh, the award of the contract is contingent upon council approval, and council then, when we bring the RFP forward for to award, council has that ability at that time to turn around and say, 
we don't have the stomach for it, we're not going to go forward as it is submitted at that point. So either way, it's coming back to council for consideration once the RFP is closed, the evaluation is taking place, and a recommendation is put forward. Uh, thank you, Patrick. So essentially, this, it was a waste of time having this motion put in front of us because the old one said knock it down or a design of a new one, right? So if we defeated this, we just go back to the old motion anyway that calls for an RFP for a design and build. I don't know if, if this one clears that up maybe a little bit, but. If I may, uh, my understanding is, and again, I haven't been part of this process right from the start, my understanding is the old resolution that was improved also included consideration for a renovation of mm -hmm. the existing building. What we're doing is taking that out of there and saying, we will issue an RFP just for design, demolition, design, build. And just one last comment that we did show an option in here that came from administration. I, said, I think they said the only other viable option was what we also talked about a year ago, two years ago, was to do a really nice green space project there that provided a lot of, well, the amenities are listed there, but, um, and we had talked about during one of our educational sessions we had, we did talk about doing a, uh, making that the, the gold standard for outdoor spaces in the, in the city. And that does show as an option on here, is sort of remind people of that, so. Yeah, anyway, so. Sorry for dragging it on. Thank yeah, you. okay, so let's, are you done? Yep, thank you. Okay. So council's driving the bus here, like make, no make mistake, and they have all along. Uh, uh, administration have made various uh, recommendations and council has or has not uh, adopted them. They put forth the recommendation of knocking it down and council didn't go for that. Council can still go for that. So we're gonna have a, be having a vote here shortly. Up till now, we've had the, the majority of council has given uh, administration the directive having listened to the uh, community that they wanted to continue some manner of a community center in that area. So that's what majority of council has voted for so far. I guess if it fails and council wants to put the motion back on the floor that we knock it down and build a green space, that's council's still prerogative to do that. But the one thing that the RFP will do that we've not been able to do so far is we finally let the rubber hit the road. Like we haven't, we've had estimates, we've had opinions, we've had seat of the pants calculations and so on. We've been kind of spinning our wheels, uh, not knowing what this thing is really gonna cost. So this thing finally, uh, if this motion passes, gets us out there. Then we're gonna have a real live marketplace sort of bid on this thing, at which point in time council gonna decide, yeah, that looks pretty good, what they're offering and the price tag we can handle. Away we go, or it's, uh, what did Patrick say? We don't have the stomach for that. We're going to some other kind of plan B. Um, uh, Councilor Cullen. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I don't have a problem with the process because the process, yes, has been muddy and yes, it has been a long road, but where we're at tonight seems to solidify the what we're talking about for the community center, what we're talking about which is best for the city of Brannan. If we're looking for a prototype to replace other uh, community centers in the future, uh, they're all basically been eight huts that have been moved in that are just about at the end of their, their life cycle. Uh, I know that we had uh, invested money into uh, you know, a, a master plan, but it was just such a, it's a small part of that master plan. And uh, it, that particular part was not accepted by the, the, uh, the board and some other people. So I think that as much as it has been messy, uh, we're, today we're saying we're not going to invest in the old building. 
that the old building has run its course. And now what we're trying to do is establish some sort of a presence, a, a modest building, a modest build that would suit the needs for the community for the next 60, 70 years. These, these good folks won't even be on that board 60, 70 years from now, but I'd like to see that the community centers uh, have the ability to do what they were designed to do. We saw that with the YAC program today. Those are operated out of community centers. So to have this community or this area, this local community center be able to participate in those type of programs and, and yes, they've had a rough go. Um, so if, but this group would like to see if they could, you know, dust themselves off and go at this again and uh, see if we can uh, give them something that we can, uh, we can take care of. The other thing is this is our building. We're in charge of maintaining this building. But the bottom line is the building's at the end of its life cycle. It's done. It was probably never a great building to start with. But uh, so, you know, I will be supporting this motion. Uh, to, and I don't foresee that it's uh, something where we've, it's been a fiasco. It's been democracy in motion. It's like, uh, that's, it's come around a whole bunch of different turns and this is where we're at. And this would make a great prototype for when uh, the time comes to replace the other community centers, which you're absolutely correct is going to happen because they're all H huts and they're coming to the end of their, their life cycle. I'd love to be able to use this as a, as a, a, a step forward. But that's, uh, again, my, where I, I think I'm going with this right now. Did you have your hand up, Councilor Shaboy? Yeah, thanks, Your, your Worship. Um, yeah, I'm going to support this resolution too. And, and um, you know, councillors have been well aware of all the discussions we've had on uh, this center, and, and it just made practical sense to get uh, pricing in for a new build because we've seen all the pictures. And, and at the last meeting, um, I asked administration if they met with the board and there wasn't enough meetings. So they've, they've done their job. They've met with the Park Community Center and understand um, you know, the deficiencies on this old building. And, and I agree with Councillor Cullen that uh, this could be a prototype uh, for the future community centers. And I think since COVID, it's made it even more uh, that we need community centers in Brandon. Um, I just was ecstatic to see the YAC programs and I think that we need something at Park Community Center as well. <clears throat> and this is gonna be a modest build and it would be a prototype for other centers. And you know, I, I don't wanna hear about uh, the problems of the previous board or the other boards because um, I think that in this particular part of the city, we need a community center. And we have to look after the problem that, you know, and, I, and it was unfortunate that South community center got torn down but same time I you know I think it's time that you know if we get this one right it'll be a good timing to get one there and, and have good pro programming there as well uh, Valley View had issues before and we rectified a lot of the problems there so I I, I fully want to support this and I want to see the real numbers um, you know green space uh, does not look after our needs for all the new Canadians that like to have programming needs at winter time, inside, you know, indoors as well as out, you know, like there is some green space there that can be accessed uh, at all seasons, but you do need indoor space. And we have an aging population that can be accessing a center as well. Uh, more and more as I see uh, all the boomers getting up, they're gonna need more yoga classes, exercise, social events. Uh, as an age-friendly community, I think uh, the program for community centers has to be revisited, and, and I think that they really would work. So I fully support uh, looking at a new build for this and, and take it from there. Thank you. And I've got Councillor Lukey, uh, and then we're starting kind of round two here, I think. So go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'm glad we're, we're at least acknowledging South End Community Center. Um, I, 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 I'm honestly in a catch-22 and I'm probably going to abstain for voting for this. I cannot in good conscience vote in favour of this motion 
but I can't vote against it because it will just revert back to the previous motion. And I'm, I'm going to probably abstain from it. I've always, and I appreciate, in fact, I would applaud the new park board and some of the discussions. Part of my issue was it just seemed like there was a refusal to do anything but just have the same building. And I applaud the fact that they've come forward with some other things that they can do and that we can work together a little bit. I think the idea that this is a prototype to build new community centers is ridiculous. If we were going to do that, we would just commit $10 million to building seven, community, seven new community centers tonight. I don't believe we'll probably build another community center in the next five years, if at all. And for me, to represent an area that has 170 square blocks without a community center, without another rental hall, and to support to build something that's within 10 blocks of another community center and five blocks of three other venues that can be rented by the public, I just can't do it. I just can't do it. Thank you. It's just the way I feel. And um, just by way of process, uh, Councillor Lupi's uh, comments just prompt. So what is on the table is a, a, an amendment to a motion. And so uh, whether or not this passes, uh, a motion will exist. Like if, if this amendment fails, you're right, it goes back to the previous motion, which will have to be voted on and no. pass it. No, Your Worship, sorry to interrupt. The, the previous motion was already adopted by Council. Oh, what we're doing here is adopting a motion previously, or amending a motion previously adopted. So if the amendment fails, the original motion is still on the, t is in effect. Yeah, unless Council wants to rescind it. Yes. Okay. It's another option. Okay, back to round two. We've got Councillor Fawcett. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Um, I, I, I'm following our own path here, as winding as it's been. And uh, I think, um, you know, I, I followed uh, Councillor Desjardins on, on this. He asked for this to be in there because, to his credit, he said, you know what, we can't make this decision until we actually see real numbers. And if that's what we need to see, then, then let's, let's see them. We, we, we should have got here way, way, way before. I, 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 everything that, uh, I was gonna call him doctor, but uh, Councillor Lupke <laughs> just said there. He, uh, uh, I, I, I agree with like 100%. I, I just the, the logistics of it all, uh, the original plan, you know, for $500,000, which we budgeted, we can make great space there try to recognize the heritage of that old place that for two decades hasn't really done much. Uh, we just talked about Westridge Community Center and having the YAC program there. Well, you know, we'd build this new one and the YAC program would move over there. I actually recall having a discussion with, uh, with Mr. Rock about why we don't have an outdoor rink on the sportsplex anymore. We have no outdoor rink on the North Hill. We of course got rid of our community center a long time ago. There's two houses that sit there now. Uh, because we have the sportsplex as a community center, which we don't use as a community center at all. But, uh, and, and we got rid of the shiny rink up there because it was too good and it took away from everybody else's rink. So, like, unless we kind of have a, a, a plan, like, if East End Community Center or Westridge or one of the ones that's really active and strong, they, that you couldn't even take away from because they're already full and they're already doing stuff wanted to go with the new building. Hey, that's not a bad place to model it. They're good for 250 days of the year. We have a, we have a plan for, I don't know, I don't see any plan for any days of the year yet on this new building. <laughs> you know, I know West Main Immigrant Services talked about going in and trying to do some stuff, but it wasn't received to go in. I, but I recall voting with Councillor Desarle to say, because he said, I'd like to see real numbers before I decide on this. And so we have prolonged it long enough that if we now don't see real numbers, then we don't even know what we're going to vote on. But uh, I, I've not been a fan. I thought that the city came with a good plan early on. Uh, it was going to be a really great green space. It was going to add to the area. Um, I was a fan of that. I think it would have worked really good. 
right this minute, we're having a bit of an issue with indoor spaces because everybody after COVID is trying to grab space, but hopefully we don't go back into that and that levels out again. But I, I'm with Councillor Lukey, uh, but you're right, the process got us here, we voted on it, Councillor Desarley asked, I want real numbers, and I guess unless we do this, we won't get real numbers, and then the next meeting we have, because there has to be another one, the next meeting we have, we'd look at real numbers and decide, yes or no, are we doing the Park Community Center, are we building a new one there, or are we going to our green space plan? I think that's, that's the, so our next meeting would decide that, we'd send this RFP out, and, and hopefully we have a plan that comes with that, that says, you know, here's 200 days, here's what we would get, not here's what we would steal from Westridge, here's what we would take from somewhere else. So I, I, I'm going to support the motion just like we did before with Councillor Desjarlais, and I guess I kind of thought we'd already have these numbers at some point. It seems like we've been just been spinning and spinning. Okay, I got Councillor Barry, then Councillor Parker, then Councillor Desjarlais. Yes, thank you, Worship. Um, just a couple of comments, and I do have a question, actually, I hope it can get answered, but it, it's to Councillor Parker's point. You know, when he talks about we adopt a policy, we adopt a plan, he's absolutely right. And then we go and change our mind a year or two years later, and we've done it several times. Ever since I've been on council, we've done it several times. Does that make it right? No. If I can take a line from Captain Jack Sparrow, it's not really like the pirate's code, it's more of a guideline. And that's kind of what the, we're getting with the, the plans and that, is the guideline. Um, I was one that voted in favor of the new recreational plan. I'll be honest with you. There was stuff in there I didn't like. The community centers was one of them and what they were planning on doing there. But do I vote against everything else because there's two things I don't like in the plan? Um, it just didn't seem right. That being said, um, I think, again, we need to see the numbers. We're getting right back to the numbers, whether it's repair or new build. I want to see what it's going to cost. I said that right from day one, and I want to make it known that whether I'm on council when this RFP comes back or whether I'm not, does not guarantee I'm going to vote in favor of it, but I want to see them. I want to see what they're going to be. I'm not promising you that I'm going to be in favor or not in favor or whatever. My question is, with the demolition of Park Community Center, uh, I don't think the rezoning changes, but with a new build going up there, does it affect anything with conditions of the new build, because the one thing I know we had a problem with the Westridge and, and, and Park does is parking. So when we put a new building up, is it gonna change any conditions of operation of that building as a community center, i.e. parking, when basically the only thing there is street parking? Because we had the same problem at Westridge until we moved the rink. Hmm. That, so, uh, I mean, I don't wanna commit a whole bunch of money to something after we tear down the building, we find out we can't even do. Well, we'd certainly have to get that answer before. Yeah, and that's kind of my, my question. I don't know if Mr. Bowles or Mr. Rock have that offhand. Uh, I, I, I can help you out, Perry, unless you get an answer. Well, through you, Your Worship, to Councillor Barry, we are limited in the amount of green space that we do have in downtown now. We haven't got the required green space that we should have through our, that area of the city. It is all on street parking, okay? So we wouldn't take green space and turn it into a space for the automobile because there's parking throughout all of downtown. But there may not be drive up to the front door parking. You may park two blocks away and walk to the community center. Follow up your worship, and that's, that's fine. My question is, will it have an effect on the permit being issued to have a new build and park because there is no parking? My understanding. Imagine, we're going, like that's been a lot of years since park was built. Things have changed. My understanding, I don't think it will because okay, it that's already exists what I wanted to know. with uh, parking on street parking in the neighborhood. Okay. Okay, and Councillor Parker, then to Jarley. Uh, thank you. I just, I'm as guilty as everybody. I'm not sure why we're debating whether we need this or don't need this or whatever right now because the, the, the whole point was let's just get this motion on the table and get the RFP so that we know what we're voting on. Right now, we don't know what we're voting on, so. We kind of spun our wheels for half hour to get to exactly where we should have got to in 30 seconds. And we should have just, once we had clarification on what the, what this motion meant and what it, the consequences were, we probably should have just voted. Okay, Charlie and I think maybe Luke Key. 
Well, thank you, Through Your Worship. It feels like we've had this conversation uh, a few times, uh, and we've all said the exact same things every time. Um, so I don't have much else to say other than, uh, you know, I implore, I hope that Council is going to allow the RFP process to occur so we can let the market tell us what this would look like, envision a different city or not. Um, I don't like it when we get into the ward versus ward mentality here because that's just not how I think. I'd be in favor of doing this no matter where I reside in the city. I'm representing the city of Brandon, South Center, Victoria, I don't care, it's the city. And I'm representing the idea of the Park Community Centre. In my opinion, you know, if it's two million, I'm not voting for that either. I'm not voting for whatever just because I love the Park Community Centre. It's got to make sense for the city. But I am in favor of giving the park board and the people who are behind the park and the idea of the park every opportunity to thrive and be successful and to continue in the city. And whether that's in a new building at the park or, or where it is now or somewhere else, I think the park community center should still exist somewhere in the brand. We need to give them that opportunity to do that. So I'll leave it at that. You and Dr. Lupe. Right. I've said my piece, but I am just going to provide a bit of clarity so we can ensure that our RFP is actually correct. Our City of Brandon zoning bylaw does require one parking space for every 9.2 meters square or floor area used for assembly. Which I already had researched on another issue, but that is in there. Okay. Whether we have to do we'll a get variance that. to do this or whatever, but it is yeah, in there. We'll so. simultaneously get that looked at by our planning department uh, I'm out of speak oh Councillor Frangie sorry uh, without further discussion your worship I'll be supporting the resolution tonight okay I haven't spoken too much other than clarify so I won't but we hopefully get another crack at this like hopefully the RFP comes back before this council dissolves but it's not impossible so I like Councillor Barry I hope I'm still on council when this does come back to us but again, I'll, uh, I could pull good kernels of uh, commentary from each of you uh, tonight and the many other discussions we've had about this, but one that uh, Councillor Cullen just came up with was this was kind of dem democracy in action. Uh, that's your exact words. It's a process, and that's the deal in municipal government. We're the closest to the ground. I think that's why we're all here. We're proud to be here. I know I'm uh, always been proud to be at this level. It's um, 19 years for me. I've not been interested in the other levels. And this is why, because we get to be right in the thick of it and right engage with our community. And as a result, sometimes plans do change. As Councillor Barry said, their guidelines. We've changed all of those plans, varied all of those plans. We have a process in our zoning bylaws called variation. We account for it. We expect it. So here's an example of that. That's why we get to listen to our community, I think, better than anybody. So this is a great process. Uh, this won't be the end of it. It'll be another step. And um, should this pass, we'll come back to council. Community will continue to be engaged. We'll hear from the community. Some will think that this is great. Some will think that we shouldn't spend our money on this. We're used to that. So uh, um, quite happy to put this to a question, but I'll never cut counsel off if you've got other questions or comments to make. I think I thank you, uh, Mr. Rock, standing there <laughs> having to witness this, but uh, there's nothing more. I think we're ready for the question then, and everybody understands what the question. It's uh, amending that original uh, motion that uh, basically dictates well there's another second motion to this right. will come. so this first motion is just the amendment to the original and then th we would require that second motion to sort of clarify what would be in the rfp okay all right so we're ready for the question on this amending motion all those in favor opposed that is carried and then the second uh, motion, Madam Clerk, is this one about the 2,600 square foot? Correct. Okay.
Councilor Jarley, go ahead. Yep, through your worship, that the issuance of a request for proposals for the design build of a new park community center for an estimated building footprint of 2,600 square feet be approved. Seconder, please. Councilor Cullen. Move we'll right to speak. <laughs> oh. Any discussion? And again, oh. I don't. Go ahead, Councilor. I'm just going to make a small point on our report. It was 2,500 square feet. Uh, cost estimates so yeah I think they were using that as just 2,500 3,000 just as a guideline 2,600 is what is there now if I'm not mistaken is that right Perry so it was a bit oh well, we're asking us to replace what's there okay Okay. But thanks for that, Councilor Fawcett. Yeah, through your worship. Now, just for clarity's sake, we'll vote on this, and because we were very close last time to voting on this, I think we just—it's just we ran out of time and came back for more. It would be nice to get to a, to an end at some point. So we believe the next meeting we have on this with this report could be our, a final decision. Could be. Is that our understanding? Because I really thought we were really close to this uh, last time. And I thought by the time we met again, because it was months and months and months ago, uh, that we would have all the information. So this is, I think we, we, we feel like we're gonna have all the information, a plan, some costs, uh, you know, what parking, all that kind of stuff we're asking for. And then we'll, then we'll be hopefully deciding on, on things at that point. Is when I was, um a lot younger and go back there somewhere where I didn't have a gray hair in my uh, beard I always said absolutely that when it comes back uh, that'll be the last one and whatnot but I've certainly come to know that we get curves and twists in the process and whatnot I mean and that would be the intention that okay. we're gonna get a number come back a report to design a contractor and we vote and yeah. done is that that would be the intention, it's the intention. right Mr. Senior Manager Yes, uh, Your Worship, that's ex the, the intent. So barring those unforeseen circumstances, it does go up for RFP, we evaluate the RFP, and it comes back to council, the hope that it is that an RFP or a, a contract would be awarded this year so that um, demolition construction can happen in, in the spring. Okay, Councilor Barry. Uh, actually, thank you, Your Worship. I think I just got to answer. My question was the chicken and egg, what comes first, the RFP or the demolition? We demolish the building and don't approve the RFP. Oh yeah, no, 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 we're not demolishing anything until we. Okay. Yeah, that's. I just want clarification on things. I think we're gonna get back to making the Amazon order. With chicken, chicken and egg, egg Amazon order. Order it, see what comes first. That's how you find <laughs> out. So. Okay. Um, any other discussion on the second motion? Ready for the question? Then all those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. All right. We're taking another step. To the uh, people associated with the park uh, community center back there, thank you very much for uh, coming out and for uh, contributing to the process. Uh, stay tuned. We'll uh, keep our shoulder to the wheel. I hope not. There's a hockey game. There is a hockey game. It should still be on. Won't be when we go home. Thanks, guys. And next item, Madam Clerk is the motion regarding the image capturing enforcement regulations and i would note this motion i believe was <laughs> referred <laughs> from a previous motion to the police board uh, and now it has come back for consideration so we don't have to bring the motion back from the table it's still it was never voted on we don't have to actually remake this motion yes yes this is the motion we need to make okay uh councillor lupke that's you you want, wish you um, I will. I, I know you want to amend it, so. I, I guess I am going to kind of. No, since this motion is not on the I, floor yet, can right. we. You can put you forward every motion. Change it. Like. So I, I am going to question, sorry, Madam Clerk. Well, I'm just double checking that. Uh, so. The motion that was put, it was put forward at the December 20th meeting and was tabled. Okay, sorry. And it was never. Thank you tabled for review by the police board but by for investigation by administration my apologies i pulled up the wrong minutes so because it was tabled we need a motion to bring it back from the table and then it's like uh, it could be amended or whatever you want to do with it so the motion that's on the agenda is actually the motion that was tabled correct okay correct. so a motion would be in order to bring it off the table 
Councillor Parker, seconded by Councillor Dejarly. All those in favor? Opposed? As carried. So that motion's alive again. Uh, I'll give you first crack at it, Councillor Luke. Thank you, Worship. I wish to make an amendment to the motion. And I would make the amendment and further that the City of Brandon implement image enforcement once the provincial reg legislation allows. Seconder, please. Councillor Barry, whoever wishes to speak. Uh, I'll sp sp not just to the amendment, but I'll speak to the whole thing if you wish and get comfortable. Um, notwithstanding how the province of Manitoba can allow one jurisdiction's police to use this tool but not others is likely reason enough to vote for this motion. Just imagine if the Winnipeg Police Service officers were allowed to carry sidearms but those in the rest of the province could not. I know that's exaggeration but it just seems appropriate. Automated traffic enforcement is just one tool that we can use to encourage safe driving in Brandon. Automated traffic enforcement encourages drivers to slow down and drive safely without taking away from other priorities and enforcement efforts of police officers in our city. Many other cities use automated traffic enforcement and have been improvements in overall road safety in those communities. It's difficult for police to enforce red light and speed infractions at intersections because the police must follow offenders through the intersection, potentially against the light to catch them. This can endanger other motorists, cyclists, pedestrians, as well as the officers. Cameras allow police to focus on other enforcement priorities. Automated traffic enforcement is just one tool police can use to improve road safety on our streets. Brandon police already use a broad range of tactics to encourage safe driving, including proactive enforcement, safety events and campaigns, community outreach and responding to citizen complaints and inquiries, many of which are brought forward through our city councillors. Speed is a leading cause of serious and fatal collisions and intersection speed cameras are intended to remind drivers to slow down and follow posted speed limits without taking away from other priorities and enforcement efforts of police officers in a city. Um, I know Chief Balkan has, has done his own research. Based on my research, it's extremely rare municipalities actually purchase equipment. In general, a vendor will undertake a full turnkey photo enforcement program and the city will be charged a fee. It will also uh, rate that a municipality does not, at the very least, it would be pretty rare that a municipality does not, at the very least, recoup the program costs via paid tickets. I would also remind uh, my colleagues that our City of Brandon staff is currently in the early stages of developing a Vision Zero strategy for our community. Uh, in fact, uh, I was able to attend their City Plan 2050 on that very subject recently. Vision Zero is a global movement to end traffic-related fatalities and serious injuries by taking a systematic approach to road safety. There are many different elements to Vision Zero, but there's a shared responsibility of system designers and road users. Road users' responsibility is to comply with any traffic regulations to ensure the safety of the road transport system. Road users would incur penalties if they do not. Different enforcement strategies need to be complemented to complement the road design elements. And data shows motorists are more likely to be injured in crashes that involve running a red light than in any other type of urban crashes. Most municipalities in Canada that have adopted a Vision Zero strategy have included image enforcement and Vision Zero Canada includes it as one of the tools when implementing a Vision Zero strategy. And that's all I have for the moment, Your Worship. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lukey. And I have Councillor Desjardins next. Yeah, through Your Worship. Um, fully in support of this, uh, brought it up my first year on council and um, was under the impression at the time that it was because Winnipeg had their own charter yes. and that's why they were able to have it. And so, and I brought it up a couple times after that. So when Councillor Lupke actually recognized that it, that it was in the Highway Traffic Act and it was something that we could simply amend there, I was like, well, that's fantastic, good job. And so he's brought it to Chief Balkan, brought it to the board. They're also recommending that we uh, request the province make this change. For my, you know, for residents who, this has absolutely nothing to do with the cash grab. Anybody who knows Councillor Lupke or myself or anybody, this is not what this is about. This is purely about the safety of residents and the fact that we aren't as safe as other residents in other municipalities because we don't have that photo radar. And, and one of the first places that I picture it isn't on for red lights. It's in proximity to the, the crosswalks uh, during, at the university area where I see time and time again people flying by those crosswalks without stopping and people near misses uh, d daily. So I'm, uh, I'm definitely in favor of this and I hope that the rest of council uh, supports this motion. 
Thank you. Other, Councilor Barry? Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Just real quickly, I, I seconded this motion from Councilor Lupke because I brought forth the idea of Vision Zero on behalf of a citizen here in Brandon. It would be a little bit hypocritical of me if I don't uh, infer back it when, when one of the recommendations under Vision Zero is to have uh, um, capturing enforcement regulation, image capture enforcing. So I do think it's an idea we need to look at. I know we, without getting permission from the province to do it, it's pretty much dead in the water. Um, I just want to state to Councillor Desjardins, the police board does not have a position on this at the present time. We've not stated position. So okay. until everything comes back, another report is really um, not, we're not going to be, I'm, at least I'm not speaking for the chair, but we did not state a position one way or the other on this at our board meeting. So, and that, so that's, that's all I have. Mr. Parker. Thank you. Can I just get some clarification on the amendment? Did you say, and to enforce it? like for us to start utilizing it right away or just getting the authorization to do so? To, to implement it once legislation changes, once the legislation. Okay, other uh, hands up? I'm gonna, I'm gonna weigh in uh, again to that last point, uh, Councillor Parker. I, I would say that Councillor Lupke is at least um, verifying or the council, should we vote for this, at least be signaling to the province that we would be intending to utilize this tool were granted to us. Uh, the other one was a little bit, all we wanted to do was just see if we could have it. You know, it's only because so far we're not allowed to have it. We're not saying we're gonna use it, but we wanted to know we could have it. So that would have been a bit of a hollow uh, request to the province, so at least this uh, clarifies this. So, I'm going to uh, speak to, I guess, the overall issue as Councillor Lupke did. And first of all, I want to, you know, really applaud Councillor Lupke as he always is extremely uh, well prepared and thoughtful. And, and you know, this is certainly no different. And he's done a tremendous amount of research, obviously, on his own, and, and brought a lot of tremendous things to the table. So for me, um, I've studied this. It's been discussed at, uh, you know, police governance. Uh, uh, what do we call it, kind of Association of Police Governance, uh, national conferences that I've attended, I've talked to other, certainly City of Winnipeg councillors and, and mayor that uh, uh, do have this in other uh, uh, communities. And it is complicated. You know, I, I'm certainly all for enhancing safety, uh, and that, you know, would be the impetus of, of this, as Councillor DeJarley also kind of indicated. Um, but there, there are a lot of complications to this. And, and to think that, well, it sounds like a piece of cake. If we put this in, it frees up our police officers' time from having to enforce speeding uh, violations or, or uh, red light violations and, and therefore frees them up for a lot of other areas that we need them as much or more importantly. Because uh, indeed, Safety, traffic safety is a, is a huge consideration, but I hate to say this, it's not the most pressing issue that Brandon Police Service has right now. And the continuum of difficulties that we have uh, in, in our community, um, traffic safety is one of them, but it's not the highest priority at the moment. So to think that we're gonna free up all the police time would be desirable, but that's not the way it tends to work. They're, they're, it usually creates a significant uh, amount of resources required on the on the part of the uh, generally the, the the police service. Even when you do have a contractor doing it, they still have to uh, you know manage the sort of legalities of this and the like. And then it it's uh, well we don't consider it a cash grab. The 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 people do. And what's often cited is that it becomes yet another more significant tax on uh, less affluent people. People that are more affluent, suddenly if you're caught speeding with the red light camera, like there is no other than paying the dough, there, there's no uh, infractions on your license, there's no concept. So if you can afford to pay the, pay the bill that just comes in the, in the mail, you're, you're kind of off the hook. Not the case, of course, when you're picked up by a police officer when you're speeding or you're going through a red light. But the uh, less affluent person that you know makes a mistake uh, hits them pretty hard. Like these these uh, 
um, these bills and counselors in these communities that have it tell us man oh man be careful what you wish for it is a double-edged sword like they hear from their um, they hear from their residents lots when over this issue and it's a very different some of them would say it's a bit like having installed VLTs like now that government is on the on the gravy train of the revenue they'll never get off it and yet the, the you know the impacts it have on on the uh, uh, community are worse it's not quite the same here like this should have some positive impacts on the community but once municipality get gets uh, accustomed to any revenue they would have and it's not certain that a, a community the size of Brandon is going to have a positive revenue um, it was I think in the paper if I'm not mistaken that they had an uh, example of Hamilton where they've gone into this uh, pretty seriously and it's um, and Hamilton is significantly bigger than Brandon it's costing them more than they're taking in in, in revenue so it, it is a, uh, a definite uh, cost so it, it's a it's a difficult one for me I've considered it uh, uh, greatly most of you know that I, I'm well, I'm on the police board and have, have been all the time, extremely interested in, in safety, extremely interested in finding new ways to make our police service more efficient. I'm not certain that this is it. Um, and I could see there's a uh, significant amount of interest on the part of council and I'm, I respect that. It's not completely my hill to die on. I'm uh, interested and respectful of all the other uh, council opinions and um, should it pass, you know, I can obviously live with it. I personally will not vote for it, only because I, I believe it will potentially provide more complications to our police service than it will relieve them of. And the stop there. Um, I think Councillor Fawcett has hand up. Yeah, thank you, through your worship. Um, I, I agree with almost everything you said. Uh, however, I do also really like, you know, uh, Councilor Lupe has, has put together a good uh, piece here and, and he always does his diligence and, uh, and, and I think the Mission Zero is something that we should be pursuing and I think there's other avenues as well to keep doing. I probably would have been supportive of the, what was kind of the looser uh, one to say, can we put it in our pocket? You know, the Highways Act, could they, could they give us that? And then the, the police would have it at kind of their discretion. And maybe somewhere down the road, they say, you know, there is one area, this intersection or this space. And, and, and they, I don't even know the process there. Would they just implement it or would they bring it back to council? Would, uh, you know, there would be, would there be public debate on it? I, I don't really know what that process is. Um, like that being said, the highways act, they, 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 the highways, I imagine, could put them at 18th and like any of our, can the highways not do that? Like on the highway? No, so inside, like just because it's inside city limits? Yeah, I think we're the traffic authority of inside the city limits anyway. Inside anyways. the city limits. Oh, yeah. well, yeah, that's been debatable on 18th and Breakers for uh, quite a number of years, but uh, we, we do know that we're working together there now. <laughs> you know? But uh, so I would have rather have had it maybe in our back pocket because I'm, I'm, I'm I'm hesitant to, to sort of just blind, it's blindly on my part, uh, less so on uh, Councillor Lukey's because he has done lots of work onto this. Uh, the discussions people have had with me uh, is, there's actually a lot of people commenting on just even the little speed signs we've been putting up all around the city with our very low cost little solar, like uh, I know the one that gets comments a lot is going over First Street going, uh, mm -hmm south and people say it and they just they become conscious it's like eyes that see you and say oh i see you and say oh hey by the way you're going 80 in this 50 and they oh slow down so there is things like that we got on durham right now we got a you know doesn't cost us much put them up there just a reminder when the police pull you over and say you know how fast you were going because you should have saw it uh like a block ago because it just showed you your time your speed uh I want to keep moving on the mission zero. I think that, that Bruce has got a lot of information on that. Sean has been building some. But I, I, I'm hesitant because I don't know if I necessarily am comfortable with this kind of just being implemented suddenly in the city. Uh, so maybe a little bit more. 
maybe to be discussed again, but right now I'm not going to support it. Yeah, and to that end, it would remind them that it is a two part, more like Councilor Lupke is, we're sort of debating like the whole motion right now, but technically we've got the amendment before us about the further that we implement. Oh, yeah, so I mean, we so can I, I, still. I support the, the, the original. Yeah. I'm not going to support the amendment. And I've got Councilor Parker, then Cullen. Uh, thank you, Worship. I, I was all in prior to the amendment. The amendment scared me a little bit right now. I just haven't had a chance to talk to folks much about it because I wasn't expecting to have to deal with it. You know, I haven't got any feedback really, so I'd like to get the uh, few of the residents' feedback and get a feel for it a little bit more before I went all in, but I would certainly be all in favor of the original motion. Councilor Cullen? No, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I too would be uh, in favor of the original motion, making sure that uh, the first step in a process would be to, to work with the province and see if we could get this uh, as one of the tools if we require or once we've done due diligence and sort of found out how much these things cost and and contracts and all those other things. I think the same thing, uh, the, the police board was struggling with that as well because they uh, uh, had no idea, well, how many cameras you have to buy. Do you have to buy 10 or do you have to buy 200 of them? Or what's the contract? What are they, what's their cut? How much do they take off each ticket? What, uh, you know, those kind of things. Uh, I found that uh, even working with our downtown association and uh, downtown parking, uh, it, it was recommended that we look at some of the machines where you could actually pay by credit card and all this other stuff, but the median pay to make that work would be around five dollars uh, uh, every time that you activate it. Uh, so our community just isn't big enough to do that. We're we're still at nickels and dimes and quarters. Uh, the in order to we'd never be able to cost recover some of the function. But as far as uh, uh, putting it on notice that we were thinking about it. And, uh, and, and again, the, the province would know that that doesn't mean that we're gonna implicate it, implement it. Uh, however, we do want this tool to be available should the time come or once we get the information or once our brains are loaded to find out exactly what, what's the cost. Like, you know, I, I, uh, I as well on the police board are going, I don't know, I don't know, I don't have any of the numbers. Like, like does it, like what is the commitment on behalf of our police force? Is it two officers to go through some of these files? What is it, uh, what's our storage on, on, on things? Like all that kind of stuff. I imagine as being a third party, the third party is the one that's gonna get rich. It's, uh, it'll be the management company that owns the cameras and, and maintains the cameras and all that other stuff. And those costs always just go up. So I'm thinking that, uh, you know, and again, do I like the idea of things being safer? Absolutely. Do I like the uh, crosswalks being a little more protected? Absolutely. But I'll cross that bridge when I find out uh, whether we're actually going backwards, uh, um, that, we're, we're, that we're not getting the bang for the buck that we need. And in order to do that, I gotta get a quote. I gotta get, I have to understand what, uh, what those contracts look like and, and maintenance agreements and things like that. But as far as us going ahead right now and asking the province, uh, that we would like to do this, we'd like to experiment, and we'd like to sort of fly it up the flagpole and see how that works, uh, and find out what our costs would be and get some quotes. Yeah, I'd like to do that. I would, uh, I would like to know, uh, uh, have this uh, deletion from being able to do it removed provincially. And I didn't have any either hands up. Uh, are we ready for the question on the amendment. Everybody understands what that is. The amendment uh, adds in the phrase that we would implement it uh, should we be given the authority. So I'm gonna call the question on that. All those in favor? Opposed? That is defeated. So we're back to the main motion, which would really you now just be seeking the authority have the authority. If we have further discussion, Councillor Lupe. Oh, thank you. Uh, it's just as Councillor Cullen was speaking about uh, finding out the cost and everything, it just made me think that maybe two and a half years from now we'll be figuring that part out too, just like our last discussion. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I, I just, I, I like the idea of, of at least getting the change in the legislation. I appreciate uh, His Worship's comments, uh, but it isn't something that we're going to phone the province tomorrow and to go, oh yeah, we're going to change that for you. Probably going to take, I think, anywhere from 18 to 24 months for this to, to have any traction or happen. By that time, hopefully our staff will have produced their Vision Zero strategy and presented it to council, next council most likely, and uh, perhaps that recommendation will be in there as part of that strategy. So I, I'm hoping we can at least uh, pass this motion, kind of start those uh, wheels in progress and we can move forward from there. Discussion? I will uh, say I told Councillor Lukey one time that I, I um, love to listen to our council and, and get perspectives and I, I did uh, put out my own position but I will say that what I've heard and contemplated I'm going to vote for this portion of the motion for some of the same reasons that the rest of you indicated. I think having that conversation like this will lead us into a conversation with the province that will probably learn more about the um, photo uh, capture, um, image capturing um, opportunities, uh, tools, I suppose, and uh, um, I think that will be worthwhile to us. Yeah. May I add one last yeah. quick you thing? Can, can close. I, I did, uh, in reading Chief Balkan's uh, report and his recommendation for the Winnipeg Police Service annual report, there was a note in there that there was a provincial review of the photo enforcement program announced in late 2019, and it's been delayed due to the pandemic, so this might be an opportune time to be asking the province for that uh, amendment to the legislation as well with that in mind, if they're already reviewing that part of it. And if your prediction of 18 to 24 months um, comes to play, there'll be a provincial election before then, so that will also complicate. So put it back to 36 months. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think we're ready for the question on the original motion as put. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Democracy in action. Democracy in action. Next item, Madam Clerk. Is a motion regarding an amendment to the open air fire regulation, and I would note again that this was tabled, so we need a motion to bring it back on the table. Moved by Councillor Barry, seconded by Councillor Frangi, just to take it off the table. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. So we're back to the uh, sort of original motion that was put on the floor, and then we were contemplating some amendments. So we have. Uh, well, thank you, Worship. Just a question on a point of procedure as we go forth here. There were seven amendments suggested or recommended at last meeting to be put on here. Uh, can we vote on them one by one separately before amending the original motion so that the ones that out of the seven that make it to the next round, um, we can start there? That would be my recommendation, is that you put yeah. each amendment forward first. Okay. And then the final motion would be adopted as amended. Okay. Each most one by one. Oh, yeah, here. most of them were mine. I know there was a few others, but I'll, yeah, I'll start if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, first of all, the amendment, one the first amendment I'd like to make is that uh, the amendment made that people with chronic breathing disorders be able to apply for a 90 meter buffer zone with medical proof from a doctor. Uh, the buffer zone is similar to mosquito fog, and of course, you don't have to have a doctor's note for mosquito fog, but I'm asking for a doctor's note on this just so people that don't like fire pits can't just go and say, no, nope, I want a buffer zone. They have to have a reason. Yes. Okay. Seconder, please. Points. Thanks. Councilor Frangie, so mover wish to speak. Uh, kind of just did. It's it's kind of the same thing. We, you know, we can have a buffer zone for mosquitoes without medical proof if people don't like it, but we don't seem to have one for fire pits, which cause even more harm than the mosquito fogging does. So I just think it's something that, uh, to give people that right to have it in there again looking after or trying to look after people's rights to to include that in the amendments um, before we vote one other thing I, I believe I understand it um, one of the things that kind of comes up even in the mosquito is the size of the buffer um, had you given any thought to that Councillor Barry uh, you obviously have given some thought to this perhaps more than I've had it does get as you've heard on the mosquito and even this like 90 meters is quite a ways in every direction as we yep. even had. Um, and, I, and I know smoke can 
you know, sometimes you can get a whiff of smoke from a mile away and it could bother you. So I'm not sure if that would be a factor. Quite honestly, I, I didn't give it any consideration. I kind of modeled it just after what we allow for the mosquito fog, and that's where yeah. I got that from. So I figure, you know, fair is fair. I'm just yeah. kind of looking at both. Councilor Bossett. Sure. Just out of curiosity, because it is the get is versus the fogging, which is kind of everywhere, and the, and the fire pit, the, you know, 90 meters from a fire pit. You know. Well, yeah, because your mosquito fogging is from the point of who's doing the buffer zone, right? So it's from the property. Yeah. So fire pit would be the same thing from the property. Well, if you have a great big property or a big property, and your fire pit is in the far back corner, you're you're, you're very close to some neighbors, but you're a long way away from other neighbors so like you know like, so I'm not sure on the mosquito flogging so follow me like if it's from the front from the property lines the outside like perimeter of your property of your, or is it from the center of your property you know but in this case like this is where the fire pit is if it's 90 meters from where a fire pit is put that yeah, means oh, just going to be curious. curious yeah Harry do you know logistics I know, like, on the mosquito flogging we take it from the edge of the property that asked for the Right, it's from, from edge to edge. Yeah. So, right. so just a comment on this to, to Councillor Foster. Remember the difference in this is, you can't af ask for a buffer zone just because you want one. Well, I agree. Yeah. No. So I, I'm, have I'm, to I'm have pretty medical proof to have one. That eliminates a lot of people right there. Yeah. That won't be able to have a buffer zone. Yeah. Uh, because we get a lot of people applying for buffer zones, which we'll talk about later, from mosquito fogging that do it just because they don't like it. Yeah. No other reason. And Councillor Lupe. Your Worship, I had uh, looked a little bit at this and I uh, had thought that I might be amenable to a 36 meter buffer zone for Enough those 37. that can't convert. It's 100 feet, which is, if we have 50 foot lots, your two neighbors, which goes back to what Councillor Collins suggested. I don't know if there's an appetite for that. I would make an amendment if there is to this to make okay. it 36 meters instead. Is there a seconder? Councillor Chaboy. Discussion on the amendment to the amendment? Basically 100 feet, 36 meters. Councillor Parker? Um, th this is maybe a little bit, I'm gonna touch, talk about them all at once, just an omnibus comment. No, I ain't doing this. <laughs> I, I agree with uh, Mr. Boyd wholeheartedly. I was thinking about this this afternoon. Um, this is a pretty inexpensive form of entertainment for some families. For some families, it's about all they have right now. Uh, at $9.45 a gallon for gas, day trips are a thing of the past for many families. Um, this is a, a stay at home with something families like to do together. You know, the old s'mores and the hot dogs and the whatever else over the fire. So. I, I feel for people who have irresponsible neighbors, but I think we have to just follow through with policing it a little better. Um, and I think one thing that we should try to step up is uh, the materials that are being used. So, you know, garbage, you know, building materials. Um, smell of willow isn't all that wonderful. If anybody's ever lit willow on fire. Um, <clears throat> so, I'm with, uh, full on with Mr. Boy. I don't, I don't agree with any of these um, changes this year. Maybe there's a time in the future. Uh, cutting it back to midnight, I, I, I don't know what that does. Um, I, I think activities after midnight are more of a noise nuisance complaint, more so than a fire complaint, it would, would be my guess. Um, and so if you even you go to a 36 meter that's four of your neighbors so if i'm in the middle of my block the whole side of my street and the neighbor across the street none of them can have a fire pit and i think that's i think that's unfair especially this time of year um you know with the economic situation everybody's facing right now so i won't speak to any of the other amendments that'll be it i just sort of cover them all off with one comment other discussion on the amendment to the amendment reducing the buffer zone now. Ready for the question then? All those in favor? 
Opposed? That's defeated. Back to the amendment as proposed. 95, 90 meter buffer zone with the doctor's note. Any further discussion? Ready for the question then? All those in favor? Opposed? That is defeated. Next, uh, carry on, Councillor Barry. Thank you. Second one, Your Worship. Um, Amendment to the motion that the use of outdoor burning appliances shall not be permitted with sustains or gusting winds are over 25 kilometers per hour in the city. I know Mr. Boyd talked about miles per hour. I'm talking kilometers, 25 kilometers an hour in the city. Seconder, please. Councillor Lupke, who wish to speak? Uh, again, it was just, it was an amendment I threw in there because I thought with uh, winds that are gusting up over 25, uh, trying to follow that rule of thumb with mosquito fog and the, the smoke seems to carry a lot more um, further than if the winds are calm that night. So an amendment I, I wanted us to consider. Councilor Blossom. Yeah, thanks through your worship. Um, again, one of those things that's not bad in theory. Uh, considering I work all over the city, all over everywhere, but even just all over the city, if, if you live, like we live in a valley, but if you happen to live outside the valley on the top of it, I don't think it gets under 25 kilometers an hour too often. <laughs> so it, it would it would be, I don't know, it would be tough to, to regulate. And, it'd be, and, and uh, you know, so it is always windy in some certain parts of the city. And if you're inside, in a treed area just because the wind is 25 kilometers somewhere like it'd be very tough to regulate i, I think it would be difficult after jarley yeah so through your worship i i do think it's difficult but i do think that there's there's also um this is one area where i think there's some legitimacy to creating some expectations and, and some no-go zones right like maybe at least we could consider and we'd have to make an amendment like whenever there is an actual wind warning on that day if there's a wind warning from the province there's no fires in the city that day and that's pretty straightforward that's much easier to police right and then we can you know and then you know if another council wants to entertain even reducing that that number that might be a little more challenging but i think that that's easier to police so everybody's interested in that amendment I'll just, I'm sympathetic to the issue. I will concede in all the years, like I've not had a lot of feedback on, on these fires. You know, and, uh, I, I know uh, Council Barry has, and it seemed to be a bigger concentration of fire pits in your area and, and, and the like. And, you know, I like to kind of gauge, you know, what are the, what are the issues, you know, what are, what are really, bothering people and this is you know e even when this has come alive you know this has been in the paper and we're dealing with it we put it over that would usually precipitate people getting engaged i haven't i've had none to be honest with you mm -hmm. and and the, uh, this one there's a couple in here uh Councilor Barry, that i'm feeling you know might be uh uh possibilities uh, again i think this wind one although it makes sense in theory I think it's going to be a difficult one to, like they're gusting, they're up and down. I mean, the fire department is already having to manage this fire pit thing. And, and uh, Lord knows they got other things to do. And then adding another layer of complication, you know, like is it, so I, I, I don't think I'll support this yeah, one. No. And, and to my fellow colleagues, I, you know, I don't want to drag this out all night. We've had a long night already. We still have more stuff, good stuff to go through. These are just simply ideas brought forth. Yep. And that, um, honestly, when we talk about enforcement, that's the last thing we should be talking about because everything that goes with the fire pits is is complaint driven. The fire department doesn't show up unless they get a phone call. No. It is no. complaint driven. So it's not like they're out looking for these things. We're not wasting firemen's time because they're out looking for fire pits and not following rules. It's complaint driven. And, and that's an area that we'll talk about after we're done here that we'll discuss. So again, I don't want to no, rewrite this. And, well, and Councilor Barrett, don't, uh, don't even hesitate. You're doing your job, your mm -hmm. constituents are presenting this and you're bringing it forward. So don't even apologize. So 
Uh, we ready for the question on the 25 kilometer an hour uh, one? All those in favor? Opposed? That's defeated. And carry on. Yeah, number three, uh, starting in 2023, and actually this is on a suggestion from Mr. Boyd, but I'm just going to go a bit. An annual permit fee of $20 be, info, uh, be imposed uh, to new per permits uh, issued for outdoor burning appliances. It, you said actually an annual fee and new permit. New permit, sorry. No, no annual, annual fee, fee. Just, just a, a new annual. permit fee okay. for okay. people Burn wanting fees. to. Okay. What, and twenty dollars, not fifty, and not ten, which Mr. Boyd suggested. Okay. Seconder, please. Councillor Lupke. We were Start started twenty twenty three. Sorry, I should. Have, yeah, it's in there. So. Uh, would you like to speak? Uh, yeah, just real briefly. We've talked about. You know, this isn't a cash grab. It's not a revenue grab. There's there's always need for revenue in the city, but we need to some at some point, even on the fire pits, like we do with either dog licenses. And not everybody gets a dog license. Hey. And that we know that but people now in 2023 going forward that want to put a new fire pit in i think a one-time fee of 20 dollars uh, we have them on record as we do everybody else but you know we are taking the time to go out and inspect these and do this and everything else and we've we've never charged a fee before i think it's maybe time we started and that and, and that's kind of where i'm going to leave it at with that so any further discussion just, just add that that's a great opportunity to educate new fire pit Mm -hmm. operators yeah. on what's allowed and what isn't allowed which I know they do already but there's also a cost with the printed materials or whatever else that you might uh, have associated with there's that. There's cost, so, yeah. Okay, we're okay, ready for the question on this one. All those in favor? Opposed? You said no. That one is carried. Carry on. Uh, thank you. My last one. Uh, Amended that the hours of operation for outdoor burning appliances be limited from 4 p.m. to 12 a.m. Seconder, please. Councillor Lukey. And I'm just going to dial back. What were they before? They were going to be noon. Noon to 12. Yeah. Okay. And we were, please speak. Yeah, right? just again briefly. Um, this is more of a, a, a personal thing. I like the fire pits as much as anybody does. I do not have one at my home. I do have one at the lake where we put it, you know, we fire it up when we can and that. I just don't see the need, and I have this in my neighborhood. This is why we get complaints. For people to, to turn to operate the fire pits at 1030 in the morning or one in the afternoon or two in the afternoon, I just don't see the need for it. Comments about it's nice to sit around with the family and have, you know, make s'mores and do that. Yeah, it is great. Most of that's done in the evening. Why do you need your fire pit going and smoking out the neighborhood in the afternoon? And it, it has, does happen a lot. And, and I get a lot of complaints about it. So I think a period of four to 12, like an eight hour period, it allows people to have the fire pit going during a, a supper period or dinner period and into the evening long enough that they can sit around and do the family thing or friend thing and that and, and be conscious of their neighbors. A lot of problems with the fire pits that I know I have in my ward or my area is just honestly, it's inconsiderate neighbors. That's bottom line, that's what it is. And, and until we can, <laughs> I guess educate them some more. We need to start doing some more things and educating, but people got to realize you have neighbors and not everybody either, either, never mind likes a fire pit, but has an issue with them because of breathing or COPD or something like that. And, and we need to have a little respect. So I think if we shorten that time, they can operate it. It helps a bit. Um, I have a question for you. There's a, I don't think it's yours, but there's a, another potential one where it limit the length of time that someone can burn to four hours daily. So that's not mine. I know it's, yeah. I was going to ask your opinion. Um, would that, like for example, what if uh, you got a little family gathering or it's Father's Day brunch or whatever and it starts at 12 um, and you want to have fire for the kids and whatnot and so those people are going to burn, because uh, I think the, the ones you're trying to get they're lighting it up at 10 o'clock in the morning and just stoking it away. It's going on all day long, 12 hours a day, every day, and that's what's driving people. For your worship on that question, just a personal perspective, because I don't know if anybody else has this problem. I've said this before. We have an inordinate amount of fire pits in our direct area. So if we did the four-hour rule, I'd have somebody going at 10 in the morning. I'd have somebody going at 2 in the afternoon, supper time, 10 o'clock, you okay, name it. So They'd be all continuous. Yeah. So it just stretch over the whole day again, like what we're trying to you know, condense a bit here. But you wouldn't have so, six at the same time. Yeah. Councilor Boston? Yeah, through your worship. Uh, again, we're just sort of picking at little things here, but 
I would like I would rather see it to 1 a.m. And the only reason I say that is because in the summertime, we live in a great space where it can be almost still light by at 11, you know, at 10:30. And so on the weekends and things like that, there is people. The, the, it's the noise is the bigger issue. You know, it's 10 now. <laughs> 10 now, and it's still not really really dark. You know, versus the winter when it you know at 4:30 it's dark. Um, so a lot of people don't get going until a little later into the evening, even one o'clock. And it really, honestly, it's it, the noise is the bigger issue for most neighbors. And and and, and Sean is dead on. Like, unfortunately, nuisance neighbors are a big issue in our community, and it is tough to sort of brush the whole community with things to just try to regulate the nuisance neighbor. Uh, when most of the neighborhoods and most of the residents are all trying to to be good neighbors so you know we are like we don't need to handcuff all of them too much but that would be one thing just being a summer person that the light doesn't go down until it's later in the day and you can make an amendment uh, oh I can make one an amendment if you want for do it well. one o'clock okay one to one o'clock four till one seconder one o'clock no good generally comes Discussion on that, Councillor Bajarli? Yeah, well, through your worship, I just like I have a discussion on, and I, I don't want to be talking about this for six hours either. <laughs> but I'm not sure the time of when we have these things matters. I really, I'm really not no. convinced at all. And I feel like we might be punishing, and we've talked to some of the good neighbors that quietly go about their their fire pits, use dry wood, <coughs> might be starting their fire pit at 5.30 in the morning, getting up early, going for fish, because they're gonna go fishing at eight in the morning. Now we're telling them they can't do that anymore because some yahoos use their fire pit from 10 to eight and burden everything, you know, everything in the city in there. So I'm, I'm worried about that, uh, which is why I'm not in favor at all of any um, time, um, parameters like of when you can have it the length I'm certainly willing to entertain that and I'm not sure how we could police but I'm sure we could I'm sure because a president's gonna know it. hey they've had that on for five hours like let's call fire and get them to shut this thing down right I think that's easier to do I I'm I, I'm, I'm just not in favor of the, the parameters of you know 12 to 1 or anything like that because I know people in town that have early morning fires that are put out before anybody wakes up and it's no harm no foul okay. yeah just a quick comment I, I don't disagree with with Councillor Gisarli on that my point on the time is it's all about enforcement and I think that's where we get got to get stronger we've done the education we now need to start writing some tickets to some of these repeat offenders and I've got lots of offenders is the big that, that are doing that the thing with the with the time limit is it's defined. Your four hours, prove it. I started my fire at ten o'clock and I got it going past two o'clock. Yeah. They can't write a ticket on that. They can prove it if you're going past midnight, but it's very hard to prove in a in a in a four hour period when somebody started a fire. That okay? No, I didn't start my fire at ten. I started at eleven. It's only two o'clock. I get another hour. You you can't issue a summons on that because you can't prove it. So that's just my only point to that. So that's why I went with the time frame. It's just a little more defined. Okay, we're back to the amendment to the amendment that would have the hours four to one. Ready for the question? All those in favor? Opposed? That's defeated. Back to the motion of four to 12. Further discussion on that? All those in favor? Opposed? That is defeated. Meaning that what's, we can have another amendment, uh, another set of time, but what's still on the docket then is 12 to 12. Yeah, that, that, that's my, sorry, Your Worship, that's my question. Did we just go back to the one that was recommended through uh, Brandon and our department is the 12 to 12. That, that would stay as the most. Okay. Right. Yeah. But anyway. somebody can make it if somebody yeah. wanted like two to 12, you know, whatever. So that's still open. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you're done, Councillor Barry? Yes, I am. Thank you, Worship. Okay. Uh, 
I don't know, who, I recall who the other authors are. There's a couple others in here, so. Five was Barry. Yep, I will be withdrawing my motion. Okay, my, well, you didn't yeah, really make it. It was just a suggestion. Councillor yeah. Chaboy. Thank you, Worship. I had uh, an amendment about an education program, but it's including the recommendation here, and there's lots of information on uh, the, the carcinogens and, and the environmental impacts of fires that I think would be included in there on on the recommendations, so I don't think I need to make an amendment. You're right. And then the other one that was on there was the limiting the hours of to four hours daily. It, I don't know if anybody wanted to put that. Like it? Okay. Um, all right. If there are no other amendments to be uh, provided, we're back to the original motion. Um, as amended, I think we passed one amendment that included the $20 just fee for new. Yeah. And that limits the hours of 12 to 12 and prohibit the use when. Uh, uh, poor air quality is issued by the province and public education is in there. So, any other discussion? Councillor Jarley? Yeah, well, through your worship, I would, I guess, I would like to make an amendment. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, and I'm, maybe Heather can help with the language, or maybe Bruce, because he's a very good writer. Um, that we uh, allow for some residents um, to um, apply for. Um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Special permit. Special permit uh, for cultural or ceremonial grounds on so okay. cultural or ceremonial grounds. Okay. Uh, seconder, please. Councillor Barry. Again, uh, if you got that, that there be a provision that people can apply for special dispensation. To fall outside the 12. Fall outside uh, the hours. Yeah, 12 hours. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Councilor Lupe? For clarity, who would they apply to? Fire Department. Fire Department. Yeah. Any discussion? Hello, great uh, amendment, in my opinion. I wouldn't have thought of it. Ready for the question? All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Now we're back to the original with two amendments. Any other discussion or amendment? Ready for the question on this? All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Thank you very much. Democracy in action. Sorry, Your Worship, can I just make a moment before we leave the subject? Um, <clears throat> thanks, Your Worship. I just wanna thank everybody for their indulgence on this. I know that it's me bringing up a lot of times that we do have a real problem in our area with this. I know a lot of others don't get a lot of calls or emails or whatever, which is kind of irrelevant. What I am gonna ask is when we had the presentation from the fire department, um, I heard over and over and over again about the calls I did get, even though they're not phenomenal, but it was education. And I'm gonna ask the deputy chief to please take it back to the fire chief and the rest of the members. And we need to start doing some serious enforcement and that means writing some tickets and summons. No more education to repeat offenders because I know there's some out there, because I know where some of them are, and enough education. We gotta start getting a little tough with these guys and taking some money out of their pocket, because it, honestly, it's, it, the whole problem with this is just uh, people have no concern for their neighbors and don't care how big their fire gets or what they're burning or who it bothers, because it's their right to have one. And, and we gotta be a little bit more unselfish and start thinking of our neighbors and some of these things. Having a fire pit is fine, but when you get the flames jumping up eight feet, and almost burning down your fence or having the smoke blown so bad because you're burning garbage or something else and it's choking somebody else out, that's inconsiderate. And, and we have a lot of that. We need to start enforcing it because I guarantee you, you will get phone calls. And if I find out they're not being followed up, I'm gonna be coming down and having a chit chat with you guys down there. So, so that's all I have to say, so thanks. Okay, thanks for that. And next item, Madam Clerk. Is an application to subdivide 1928 McDonald Avenue. Okay, Councillor Jarley, please. Your Worship, I move that the Planning Commission recommend Brandon City Council approve the application to subdivide 1928 McDonald Avenue in the residential low, uh, uh, sorry, to create one lot in the residential low density uh, area subject to the owner or successor 
one submitting three hundred and thirty six dollars and fifty two cents to the city of Brandon planning and buildings department as a cash in lieu contribution to public reserve purposes two submitting written confirmation to the city of Brandon planning and building department that the Brandon school division uh, has received two hundred and eighty three dollars and fifty cents as a cash in lieu contribution for school purposes three provide written confirmation to the city of Brandon planning and buildings department that taxes for the property to be subdivided uh, for the current year, plus any penalty, interest, and arrears have been paid in full, or arrangements must be made satisfactory to Brandon City Council. Four, submitting written confirmation to the City of Brandon Planning and Building Department that arrangements have been made for an easement agreement and plan of easement to the satisfaction of Manitoba Hydro and registering the easement agreement along with the easement plan if required in series with the plan of subdivision. And Five, submitting written confirmation to the City of Brandon Planning and Building Department that arrangements have been made for addressing of the subdivision to the satisfaction of the City of Brandon Real Estate Administration. Seconder, please. Councillor Frangie. Um, this is going to drive the City Clerk crazy, but I'm going to immediately make a amendment. That the first line reads based on the planning commission's recommendation comma that brandon city council approved the application so your worship if i may we can treat that as a typo and the the recommendation or the motion would be that the application to subdivide blah 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 be approved subject yeah because it was not really a no sound i don't motion. that was a okay. technical error by planning <laughs> okay well i'm fine with that normally you wouldn't allow me to do a friendly amendment they don't exist so I'll i was going to do it properly we'll okay. let you do that. so if that's the case then i'm fine back to the motion uh mover wish to speak or did we uh, need uh, this fairly straightforward but three were survived i thought this was a pretty straightforward subdivision yes uh, again and, and uh i think mr kulak is available for questions if we had any here's we don't much as he loves to speak with us, but uh, I think we're going to call for the question then. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Thank you. Next item, please. The cessation of train whistles on the Canadian Pacific Rail Line at 34th Street. Thank you, Your Worship. Before I bring this forward, did, was it, did a council bring this to administration bring up, or is this like administration doing this on our behalf, like just for the goodness of residents? I did uh, raise it with administration some time ago. It was something we routinely done. Um, only I knew when I first became a counselor in 1995, I worked, we had the whistles ceased at 26th Street. And, you know, we got to have the proper crossing and, and so on and so forth. And now that we're building another such one, we're eligible to do that. So engineering is bringing this forward as a normal practice. So you thank you for your worship. I move that administration be authorized to inquire with CP Rail regarding the cessation of train whistling at 34th Street in the city of Brandon. Yeah, yeah you can keep going. Sorry. I know, I know it's confusing, but you can keep going on this one. And further, <laughs> that administration be authorized to issue a public notice of the intent to pass a resolution to stop train whistling at this location. Second by Councilor Cullen. Whoever wish to speak? Well, I don't know, through your worship, I, 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 I think I'm in favor, but uh, Councillor Parker missed a lot of putts on Wheat City with that train whistle blowing, <laughs> so I don't know. I was thinking yeah. maybe we keep that whistle. I was thinking more the slices into the river. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's um, you know commonly done in urban municipalities. Uh, obviously, you've got to have the right equipment. There's a small um, insurance uh, fee to be paid um, and I love the idea yeah, yeah. yeah. There, you know and I'll, I'll, I'll state which I stated whatever 20 years ago does not mean the whistle will never blow like that no. um, engineer is still if he sees something and he she sees something uncomfortable at the track they're going to be hammered on the whistle to warn people and that's what is there but other than that i mean the, there's still the bells and the arms and everything else is you know highly protected so it's any other discussion and we could add this is kind of on the on the uh, dividing line between councillor cullen's ward and 
and Councilor Cameron's award. Councilor Cameron, right here. Go ahead. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I think that uh, the whistle and the bells and the flashing lights would be an over statement of what has to happen there. So uh, those, the bells will ring and the arms will come down and everything. So the, uh, I don't believe that we need the whistle at the same time. So I think that it would be, uh, that would be prudent to remove one of those, uh, those elements, especially for the people living right there, right at that, that intersection. Okay, we won't be, there's still another crossing, uncontrolled crossing at 50th Street. We'll still play with the golfers uh, out at that end of the uh, golf course because they'll start blowing that about the 18th uh, hole there, I suppose. Move it back a bit. Ready for the question? All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Next item, please. As per Councilor DeJarley's notice of motion, we consider an amendment to the notification requirements for downtown parking bans. Councilor DeJarley. Thank you, through your worship. I move that administration review the notification requirements for downtown parking bans to provide possible amendments to the traffic bylaw uh, number 5463 for Council's consideration. Seconder, please. Councilor Cullen, whoever wishes to speak. Very briefly, your worship. Um, we don't have to make a decision today, but. Um, currently, we provide 24-hour uh, notification, uh, no parking in the downtown for events. Um, in my, um, in my uh, belief and in many uh, business owners' uh, positions, uh, it's, uh, it's unnecessary and could be causing uh, you know, undue uh, hardship to uh, businesses in the downtown. And so I'm hoping that uh, administration can have a look at the bylaw and see if we can't make some amendments uh, that shorten that duration while still ensuring that we're, you know, upholding our, you know, our, our responsibilities uh, under uh, a traffic bylaw to, you know, allow enough time for residents to remove their cars on a no parking ban. Yeah, and I, I, uh, I'm going to vote for this from the standpoint of let them review and come back to it. So I like how you've handled that. Uh, whether you know because we're going to be a balance between giving people proper notice otherwise you know the parade's coming and somebody didn't have enough notice and they left their car there and the next thing we got to be towing and that's even more cumbersome so you know i'd love to hear administration's point of view on that and if they're opening up that bylaw i noticed that horses yes, are included in this mm -hmm. thing that uh, yes. i might Traffic want to see us yeah, the well, horse is back on because I'm ready to ride again. <laughs> In addition to that, through your worship, but we also noticed that there is actually no 24 hour notification within the bylaw. It's actually 12 hours. Oh, that's right. But it might be 24 hour notification to tow a vehicle. So there right. might be some disagreement between yes. those things. So we just need to suss that out. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I, I am in favor of letting people know that there's an event happening in the downtown. Yeah. And I think that that's what those no parking signs could eventually do for us. So uh, anyway, I'm, I'm looking forward to the report back. Further discussion? This will just be a review and then we'll get another crack at it. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Next item, please. A quotation for a 5,000 pound propane forklift. Likes that one. Councilor Lupke, go ahead. Thank you, Worship. I move that the bid from Toramount <coughs> Material Handling, a division of Toramount Industries Limited, to supply a 5,000 pound propane forklift as per quote and specifications, a cost of $41,730 net of GST be accepted. Seconder by Councilor Parker. Who wish to speak? No, thank you, Your Worship. It's pretty straightforward. Any discussion? I presume it means it can lift 5,000 pounds. It doesn't weigh 5,000 pounds. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. <clears throat> Next item, please. Consideration of citywide mosquito fogging. And I would note, if somebody's wondering why Councilor Berry did not give notice of motion, he did take the other avenue that's available through the procedure bylaw and presented a report through our normal process. Go ahead, Councillor Barry. Thank you, Your Worship. I'd like to move that administration be authorized to begin citywide fogging for nuisance mosquitoes immediately. Councillor Jarley, seconding. 
Who wish to speak? I will briefly. Uh, hoping everybody has read the report and the reasoning why I brought it up uh, this quickly. Again, we're going back to this uh, issue of are we following policy? Are we following our plans? No, we're not. But we all know what's coming. We've had a lot of rain and a lot of water laying around right now. We have now had the heat wave and the hot weather and it's going to continue on and you're going to see an abundance of mosquitoes having a smorgasbord on citizens within a week here. We all know this. We've been through it many a times. My point in bringing this up now is why wait until the trap counts are high enough for us to start fogging because we have conditions of the fogging which include wind speed and rain and there are not too many nights that we get that we can't actually fog. We get many nights that prevent us from fogging and not too many so I'm just trying to allow an opportunity that we have more nights uh, to be able to fog and, and help reduce the problem, especially when we've got Canada Day celebrations coming up. We've got year-end school stuff coming up. People want to be outside. We've been cooped up enough. And I just think uh, on this one, sorry, you know, to heck with policy. Let's get at it. Let's get it done. Because we might have to do it more than once. Okay. Second wish to speak? Thank you, Through Your Worship. I mean, I think that this should be our policy. Right. Our policy should be that council can, can quickly get administration to fog as early as we, we need to um, for the future. And I, I, cause I just think we've witnessed in the last couple of years, just how quickly the numbers can escalate. We can't wait those five or six days for them to go look because it's too late. Right. I think it last year was within, within like five or six days, the council went from nothing to thousands and thousands within there, like astronomical numbers. And so I think we're just trying to be proactive here. And uh, now that we don't use melathion, there just aren't the same harmful effects from fogging. I was one that was on the fence with fogging before we started get, not using melathion. And now I'm in total favor of this, so. And I've got Councillor Fawcett, then Lupke. Yeah, through your worship, uh, when, uh, Councillor Barry put this out there to push the urgency. I was 100% with them because we know how this happens. And this is a particular year uh, that honestly, this is almost a mental health thing for some. Like we might still get some nice days, but it's the worst April, the worst May that we've ever seen. We're coming out of COVID. If you can get outside and do some stuff, we want to enjoy it. We need to enjoy it. Um, and then also like on the Mission Zero, like the most distracted I ever get is trying to get mosquitoes in my car that just drive me insane. Yeah. Uh, so if we can minimize that, that might help the mission zero. Okay, Councillor Lupke. Thank you, Worship. I'll be brief because I remember we had this discussion last year and that discussion included uh, whether a review of the policy was in order and I don't think that actually happened because it seems to be unchanged. Uh, I did happen to check the count from the weekend and it's pretty close to getting ready to do it so I will be supporting but I wonder if we should either add amendment or which I think we can do probably can't do it on the motion to ask our staff to review the policy and report back to council on that if that's possible because sure. I, I I'm, we had that discussion I think we talked about looking at the policy and seeing if it was still what we wanted or or if it can be amended to to deal with some of these things so I would make an amendment that in addition to what Councillor Barry is proposing that we also ask administration to review the policy and uh, provide a report back to council with any of the Thank you. Uh, spoken to it probably. Uh, anybody want to add? I would like to add because the one thing, uh, Councillor Charlotte made the comment, yeah, this probably should be our policy. The only uh, problem is that we tried to have, and, and this preceded me, so somebody around the table that can take credit for trying to create a better system so that it didn't require politicians, didn't require a council to have to get together to trigger the mosquito fogging. Like, I mean, this will be the, probably the earliest we fogged. So normally it's a little later in the summer where we're only meeting uh, once a month, right? So now, of course, we could have a, special meeting to, to do that, but the system should be set up so that administration don't have to wait for us. The, it, you know, it's, it's a bit like we don't have a meeting to tell them to plow the snow. Like we've got it all laid on there and they go. They're in the middle of the night, off they go. That's the kind of system I like. Fire chief doesn't phone me and say, somebody's phoning for an ambulance for you, <laughs> you know, they go. 
so this needs to be the same. So I really support this, uh, adding this amendment to it. So, you know, I think some of us have thought maybe the threshold's too high and, and you know, some other factors like maybe trajectory needs to be taken into account. Yeah, frequency, I think, is another one. That's one we were talking about. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so again, I, I like that addition because I think we need to clean this up so that it doesn't rely on us having to get together and we're the scientists now, we're making the, that kind of call, we need to bake that in, so. Uh, Councilor Parker? Yeah, thank you, Worship. Yeah, I, I, I'm, again, all in on this one because of what everybody's going through. A lot of people are stuck at home. We've got to do what we can do. There's not much we can do about 944 a gallon gas, but we can make their backyard more comfortable. So let's get it done as quick as we can. Uh, we still may see a bit of a delay. Don't we have rigs off being calibrated or something? That was my next I mean, question here as soon as we're done. Yeah, and I, I was a little worried about the, the terminology when you end it with it immediately. Could that <laughs> could mean tonight? Uh, but, you know, to me, as soon as possible. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. but uh, back to this amendment about the uh, reviewing the policy and reporting back to us. Ready for the question? All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Back to the motion as amended. I didn't have any other speakers uh, ready, so um, does administration have any concern about, like when we say a, the motion says immediately, is that too, okay, that doesn't give me any heartbreak. Obviously they're gonna get to it as quick as they physically can, so. so yeah, yeah, through your worship, just a point on that, I was gonna ask the city manager if he could please uh, uh, send a correspondence out to council advising as to when we can start because I did send an email out earlier asking are we ready uh, and I know there was like was brought up here there was some stuff that needed to be done for uh, calibration and product but it'd be nice to know when we can actually start that everything's ready to go because it's it's like you said nice to say immediately well we can't start for another two weeks anyway well yeah we'd kind of like to know when we can start so we can advise residents of that and I'm also going to ask residents because the buffer zone uh, applications are still available um, please consider your neighbors. If you don't need a buffer zone, don't ask for one. Because as Councilor Desjardins pointed out, we do not use malathion anymore. It's a, a, a friendlier a chemical that's being used. It doesn't harm uh, the people or the bugs like mal malathion did. So please, please, please give consideration to the people in the city um, that want to get the outdoors, get the kids outdoors and that, and allow the fogging to happen. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Three words. I think it, on, on Friday they did send out that the city has sourced enough product to spray the entire city. Two vehicles with fogging equipment installed will be sent into Winnipeg this Friday. It was that past Friday. And two others next week for calibration and maintenance. To calibrate the foggers, no rain is required, so traveling into Winnipeg has been pushed back for these units. So that's sort of where they were at. Yeah, and that's why I want to get confirmation Friday. of those yeah. when we can actually. Do I don't know whether um, Mr. Pulak and Mr. Rock have an update on that. Uh, we're waiting to hear back from the City of Winnipeg as to when they can actually do the calibration because weather conditions are a factor. We can't do it on rainy days, we can't do it on rainy days. So those are factors. That's why we weren't able to do the two trucks uh, on Friday because the weather wasn't uh, suitable for it. So yeah. we're still working yeah. with them. We do have two trucks available to go out and do the fogging. We will have to give the community 24 hours of notice. We do have to advise all of the uh, hospital, healthcare facilities, schools, everything like that, that we're going out fogging on this time. And we can be set up, ready to go at 9.30 when the wind changes and we're shut down. Yeah, we're accustomed to that. Lots of conditions, yep. Lots of time, actually. Okay, um, we're, we're ready for the uh, main motion. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Uh, I did want to uh, um, add a little bit of a comment, and I'm not really sure why this is. I know Councillor Barry asked the question at budget, because we don't really have a budget line. It ends up getting absorbed in our overall uh, budget, but we're going early. I think it's about 35,000 bucks a crack, if I'm not mistaken, and I'm not uh, so certain that it's gonna be a one and done this year. Like if we're, if we're, uh, Fogging before the end of June already, um, then the reinforcements are going to be coming in later in the uh, in the year, and we're going to have to go again. So I'm just going to kind of 
forewarned council that you'll have to be a little bit forbearant when the, uh, um, what do we call that, the audit and finance uh, budget review comes in. We could be a little unfavorable on a couple of lines here because of this. I'm okay with that. Takes no removal sometimes. Pardon? Takes no removal sometimes. It is. Yeah. Okay, next item, uh, Madam Clerk. Under the order of bylaws, Your Worship, bylaw number 7319, which is to establish the reserve for the mitigation and preparedness program. I can Mr. read still. <clears throat> that bylaw number 7319 to establish the mitigation and preparedness program reserve for the purposes of holding any funds received under the mitigation and preparedness program and the providing funds for any city of Brandon expenditures project or programs approved under the mitigation and preparedness program be read a second time. Seconder, please. Councillor Frangi, whoever wish to speak. I just wonder how many times we could put mitigation and preparedness program in one, one paragraph. I did not prepare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A little bit about this earlier from Mr. Pulak, uh, that we need to establish a, a reserve in order to put that uh, Mitigation money in that yeah. uh, 150 for the backwater valves. So that's what this is about. Awesome program and a good no brainer to put this in place. Okay. Ready for the question then? All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Third reading would be in order. Go ahead. I'd move that the bylaw be read a third and final time. Seconded by Councillor Frangi again. Thank you. And uh, I'm going to call the question. Third reading, uh, a recorded vote is required. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried unanimously. Next item, please. Bylaw number 7328, which is the borrowing of funds for the upgrade and expansion of the water treatment facility. And there is a minor amendment required to second and third readings. Okay, who'd like to tackle this one? Councillor Frangi, go ahead. I move that bylaw number 7328 to provide for the borrowing and expenditure of fund for the uh, purpose of uh, upgrading and expanding the city water treatment facility be amended by deleting the clause six, uh, the words, a special surcharge on per cubic meter water and wastewater utility rates and substituting, therefore, the words general water utility rates. Seconder, please. Councillor Lupke. And uh, move to speak. Oh, Your Worship. Apparently, the wording change uh, is we, we've gotten the, the authority coming back from the, uh, was it the Public Utilities Board or the Municipal Board? Municipal Board. The municipal Board, and they made that little change. They like to tidy things up. So that's the reason for the amendment. Any discussion? Ready for the question on the amendment? All those in favor? Opposed? The amendment is carried. The uh, may be now moved as amendment for a second time. Go ahead. Have the bylaw as amended be read a second time. Seconder, please. Councillor Lupke. Any discussion? Ready for the question? All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. And third reading? Uh, that a bylaw be read a third and final time. Second again by Councillor Lupke, and a third reading recorded vote is required. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried unanimously. Next item, please. Bylaw number 7336, which is to legally open the east west sidewalk along Maryland Avenue. Councillor Shaboye. Your Worship, I move that bylaw number 7336 to legally open the multi-use pathway along Maryland Avenue be read a second time. Seconder, please. Councillor Frangi, mover wish to speak. Uh, yes, Your Worship, I'll just briefly describe it from the report here. Um, uh, in 1990, the City of Brandon and Riverview Curling Club entered into an easement agreement for a period of 20 years to cover the public pathway along Maryland. In exchange for the easement agreement, Riverview uh, received the north-south lane um, with the understanding that the city may legally open the pathway lands at its sole discretion. This easement agreement 
uh, to provide public access has expired, and in order to retain legal public access, uh, administration is proposing the pathway lands be included as part of the Maryland right-of-way, which is typical for all pathways in the city of Brandon. Uh, as of all right-of-ways, the land will be transferred into the name of Her Majesty the Queen in the right of the province of Manitoba. Excellent description. Thank you. Um, any discussion? Ready for the question then on second reading? All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Third reading would be in order, please. Uh, thank you, Worship. I move that the bylaw be read a third and final time. Thank you. Seconder, please. Brangie. And probably not any further discussion, so third reading, recorded vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried unanimously. Next item, please. Giving of notice, Your Worship. Thank you, giving of notice this evening. Seeing none, next item, please. A motion to adjourn would be in order. Moved by Councillor Barry, seconded by Councillor Chaboye. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Thank you very much. Not that bad.